Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Juice Cast. Today, we'll be talking about Final Fantasy IV. And today, with me, I have Lord Truby, who's a new member on the podcast, and Lord Wolfgang, who is our co-host. You know him well. I'll have Lord Truby introduce himself since he's a guest on the podcast. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? My name is uh, Andrew Bluett. I guess now I could say I'm a little bit of a YouTuber, as cringe as that sounds. The biggest, the thing that uh, gets the most traction is my Final Fantasy retrospective series, where I dig into the development history and the context surrounding each of these games and really dig into them and try to uh, expand people's understanding of them. And earlier this year, I put out Final Fantasy IV. And at the time of this recording, I just put out video on Final Fantasy VI. So this should be an interesting conversation. And what do you do? Friedrich. I am a content creator that makes video game content and stream yeah. terminally online. Playing a lot of games for the first time. Just like this one. For me, I do character analysis over on YouTube on the main channel, The Juice Box. Um, we're actually going to be doing some Final Fantasy content early next year, shortly after the release of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Currently, what you can find on there are character analysis of Doki Doki Literature Club characters and Sonic the Hedgehog characters. So a little separate from, from this. But over on this channel, we pretty much cover whatever we, whatever game we want. Um, and today, it's going to be Final Fantasy IV. And I guess to start off with my personal history with Final Fantasy, as it was directed at me, I didn't grow up with the series at all. So there's that. I I knew of its existence due to osmosis, but only because I knew that like Cloud and Sephiroth existed due to like One Winged Angel being a meme on the internet and like YouTube poops and stuff like that. But that was about it. Uh, I never had Final Fantasy VII. It wasn't until Final Fantasy IX was shadow dropped on. Nintendo Switch that I played Final Fantasy for the first time. I wanted to do that because I liked playing Cloud in Super Smash Brothers for Wii U um, because he was very good and I thought he was really cool. So I did that and I was like, oh, I was like learning about the backstory of Cloud and I really wanted to play 7 and I was like, oh, I bet they're going to put 7, 8, and 9 on Switch and like all the Final Fantasies on Switch eventually because it would be so easy for them to do that. But then 9 came first and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to play 9. And uh, from there, I played 7. 7, 7 Remake, 1, 2, 3, 4, 15, 16, and I'm looking forward to playing 5 really soon. So that's my personal history with Final Fantasy. That's pretty awesome. Um, You're the one that got me into it. Yeah. 7 Remake. 7 Remake. Yeah, you were showing me at the gym of all places. Mm -hmm. You were showing me all the trailers and I was uh pretty hyped on it. I waited a while to play it until you were done and then I played through it and then I played through it again. And then again, yeah, I can't say it's my first ever Final Fantasy game because technically I did play Final Fantasy 10 for like an hour when I was younger. So that was my first one, but I don't really count that. What about Dirge of Cerberus? Didn't you play that? Yeah, but the, that one was a Valentine game. It was so <laughs> different than the rest of them because that was like a shooter. Yeah, game. I know. Yeah, I don't know if I would I count think that it's funny. as like a mainline game either. <clears throat> What are no. you talking about? Dirge of Cerberus is like <laughs> peak Final Fantasy. I love yeah, Vincent Valentine. <laughs> like, like, like the, the G in RPG stands for gun. <laughs> so true. Role, role playing gun. So true. I love that. I did not think of it that way. <laughs> and I'll throw it to you. What is your experience with it? So for me, uh, I did also like Juice did not grow up with Final Fantasy, but uh, when I was a preteen, I got mm -hmm. into Kingdom Hearts uh, through a friend at school. He brought in like the special edition guidebook for KH2 with the drive forms adorning both sides of it. Okay. And so I got Kingdom Hearts 1, like September 2007, and I really enjoyed it. Got Kingdom Hearts 2 shortly after Christmas, and that's like, that was my window into Final Fantasy. And obviously, only like a couple years or so later, 13 came out. And then once after that was a Platinum Hits title on Xbox 360, I picked it up on a whim. It's like, you know, I'll try Final Fantasy. You know, it's got this pedigree to it. Mm -hmm. I fucking hated it. I, I, I dropped yeah. it. I dropped <clears throat> it after two non-consecutive hours. Um, I, I did not like how it played itself and, you know, Granted, everyone has already, like, taken the piss out of 13 uh, and made the same constant criticism, so I won't harp on it. 
uh, mm -hmm. and I have, and I, I do my retrospectives. I play the games well ahead of time. Like six just came out. I just finished ten two. That's how far ahead I'm working. So I'm gonna reserve judgment when I come back to thirteen. But it was not a great first impression. But I knew that every game was different. Every game was kind of its own bespoke thing. So my senior year of high school, it was either just before or just after my senior year of high school, I was at a flea market and there were uh, two copies of Final Fantasy VII there, one uh, in the box, one that was just loose discs and sleeves. I was poor. I did not have much money, so I just bought the loose copy and I didn't finish it. I played about 12 hours. I got up to the Chocobo farm and I, I really enjoyed what okay. I played. Just life kept getting in the way. Mm -hmm. When the HD remaster of 10 and 10 2 came out on PS3, I picked it up day one and I almost got to the end of 10. I got right up to like just outside of Xanarkand. Like I got through Mount Gagazette and then life got busy and I stopped, but I really enjoyed it. I made it through the MSQ of 14, just a Realm Reborn, but I was trying to like get to end game stuff so I could do stuff with, uh, with friends. So I was skipping cutscenes, so I don't count that. That wasn't, like, the mm. a proper experience. And then in 2021, or late 2020, early 2021, I thought, you know, like, I'm doing this Grand Theft Auto V Machinima series that I had been, like, working on conceptualizing cool, in cool. production for about a year. Or not well, one year, I'm sorry, five years. Um, and I had just released the pilot... And I was like, you know, I need to have something else going on so I don't burn myself out on that because I'm a one-man crew on it. And I thought, you know, I'll stream all the Final Fantasies. And then I thought, wait a minute. No one's really talking about these games as they were in their original context. They only ever talk about them within the context of the wider series. The best example yep. is people only say about Final Fantasy 3 that it's a lesser Final Fantasy 5. Well, what about assessing it on its own merits and that kind of just blew out from there yes yeah. so <clears throat> so i started playing through the games in 2021 and i'm i'm really enjoying it i think that uh there's some incredibly interesting stories uh to be found within especially with six seven nine and ten uh and that more or less brought me right here beautiful wow yeah well said that's wild um, <clears throat> yeah that that is a long journey with them too mm -hmm. and just like just choosing to stream every single one and it's, it's a good point that you brought up in context for when the game's released like yeah people talk about how three is a lesser five but when we talked about three on the podcast we try to talk about it as if not not only it as it is now but as it released and what it did to the entire franchise you know how exactly. it influenced things exactly and I, 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 I res try to respect my audience's intelligence on that point, but there are still occasionally comments of, well, actually, Gilgamesh comes back in Final Fantasy VIII, and I'm just like, yeah, I I know, but in 1992, there was no Final Fantasy VIII. Please, <laughs> right. please, please sit down, sir, or madam, yeah. or other. Yeah. <laughs> totally. <clears throat> I did not okay. have that in depth of a experience with Final Fantasy. Maybe in the future, but not yet. You'll get there. Oh, we'll, five, five is next. You'll, we'll we'll get you. <laughs> we'll get you. Well, there. actually, seven is next for you. OG seven. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. we're gonna yeah. do a podcast on that one. Which is awesome. Yes. Look forward <laughs> to it. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I guess next would be development. Right, development of this game. Now, again, I don't know much about the development of this game. Same. I, I, I read something about its script, the total story script for the game being like a quarter of what it was supposed to be. Is that accurate information? Um, that that's half true. So, a lot of it, it was a lot of it was chopped down, but it was mostly miscellaneous dialogue. It wasn't like huge story beats or anything. And okay. the reason for that just, was just because of uh, storage capacity on the cartridge. It was it was an eight megabit cart, so literally just one megabyte. So they they had to like 
squeeze as much as they could out of it. And of the, course. the development <clears throat> of four was a bit tricky. <laughs> like just, just I haven't really heard, uh, obviously I did the video on it, but I, I didn't really see anything about, oh, this was a super troubled development, unless I'm misremembering my own script, um, <laughs> which may be possible. <laughs> uh, it's just that uh, the amount of time between three and four uh, being released was about 14, 15 months. And, you know, it took two to three months to actually manuf uh, finalize the ROM and manufacture cartridges. And originally, what we got as Final Fantasy IV was going to be Final Fantasy V. There were plans for a game called Final Fantasy IV for the mm. Famicom. Uh, yes, this I did know. Yes, this unfortunately that fell through. Um, I can't remember the exact reason. I think it was a division of labor thing. Mm -hmm. um, really? Yeah, so some of the stuff from Famicom FF4 supposedly was rolled into the game that ultimately became Final Fantasy IV, but there were, as far as I know, there were never any details on what exactly that entailed. Uh, but one significant element of Final Fantasy IV's development was that uh, Sakaguchi's, Hironobu Sakaguchi, the creator of Final Fantasy, we attribute the series mostly to him, uh, creatively at least. Uh, on the first three games, his cre he had a creative partner, Kenji Tirada, who was not really a games writer. He usually, he was more of a television writer. He wrote mm -hmm. the scenario for Final Fantasies 1, 2, and 3 based on Sakaguchi's uh, stories and plot outlines. For Final Fantasy 4, Tirada was no longer on board. He had gone back to television. And, okay. Sa and Sakaguchi, he wanted desperately to get the series featured in Shonen Jump, Weekly Shonen Jump, which I'm sure you're both familiar with in some yeah. capacity. So he called a meeting with one of Jump's editors, uh, Kazuhiko Torishima. And Torishima looked at what Sakaguchi had presented to him, and he was familiar with Final Fantasy, and he just asked Sakaguchi point blank, why is Final Fantasy so bad? And so just <laughs> over the wild. course of that first meeting, <clears throat> just tore down the first three games and criticized everything about them. And Sakaguchi went home thinking, Torishima's right. Final Fantasy is freaking <laughs> terrible. <laughs> So that's for, amazing. Yeah. So for several months, he would have regular dinner meetings with Torishima, bringing him all these concepts and drafts and outlines. Uh, and Torishima would just relentlessly criticize him on everything. But Sakaguchi knew that whenever he complimented him on something, that he had something to really good. Uh, mm. But moreover, uh, there's a consistent element to. Uh, Sakaguchi's uh, kind of ethos when it came to storytelling with the early Final Fantasies, and that is he always had a creative collaborator. The first three, he had Kenji Tirada, and for five and six and seven, I guess. Well, yeah, definitely. Uh, he had Yoshinori Kitase. Oh, yeah. For <clears throat> Final Fantasy IV, it was the only time where he worked for, uh, with Takashi Tokita uh, for the series, who Tokita would come back as one of the directors of Chrono Trigger uh, a few years later. Okay. Now Sakaguchi, he was a he was a music kid. He grew right. up, went through high school. He wanted to be a musician. Takita was a theater kid. <laughs> so you, you get you get the band kid, you get the theater kid together. You're gonna see magic. And yeah. And at the time, that's what Final Fantasy IV was. It was magic, and I've seen people point out in comments like, oh, yeah, that, that explains a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, so really, that, that, that's kind of... That, that's all that I'm, I'm really remembering right now, but I, I have... I, I'm sure I go into some more detail in my FF4 video. There's a point where I need to move on from a project, so I just kind of, like go full yeah, force on the next one so mm -hmm. yeah there, there's and I spent like 20-30 minutes in that just hammering it in and then going over more 
as the video goes on. So I'm sorry I keep plugging it. <laughs> But no, it's okay. Obviously, everyone go check out the Final Fantasy IV video. Yes, yeah. definitely. After this podcast, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not right now. You have to wait. You have to watch this first. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, that's super sick. The, the one thing that I noticed when I was playing Final Fantasy IV after playing the first three is that it really feels like they tried to take some of the best elements of those games and form what they did in this game yeah uh, that, that is a, that was a huge part of the ethos they wanted to create the ultimate final fantasy yeah um like uh, other than the job system obviously the characters have their set jobs um and their set roles in this game and they play a big part actually in the character storytelling which we'll get uh. to um you know everything else like you can see di directly especially from final fantasy 2 i want to say this one has the most in common with final fantasy 2 um than you know 3 and 1 do uh so that's interesting too <laughs> at least i find it to be <clears throat> yeah it, it definitely pulls elements from all three uh particularly the sort of almost static nature of the party in ff1 after of course you've decided what jobs you're gonna have uh, the Empire Conflict and Dark Knights from Final Fantasy 2 and pulling the job archetypes from Final Fantasy 3 and making them into more of their or, or turning them into their own like distinct characters uh, it, yeah it, it, it really it, it really does bring elements from all three together into one single package without replacing them outright yeah, and just the focus on characters and storytelling in general. I think that that's one thing that Final Fantasy II actually had over 1 and 3 that it, is yeah. like pretty evident in 4. You know, it feels yeah. like they really tried to make that a, a point. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> but yeah, with Final Fantasy II, you can definitely tell it was hamstrung by memory constraints and possibly mm -hmm. having to move development to Sacramento when... Uh, Naz Nazar Gabelli was uh, temporarily uh, had to be relocated because his visa expired. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember no, that. No one, no one would say it outright, though. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like the, the characters, they were there, but they barely had like a few traits between them. So, yeah. so, they, so actually having character in Final Fantasy IV, uh, actually having them be defined not solely by their jobs, you know, you can kind of remove their jobs but still keep them as people uh but ha keeping them in the mold of the job actually having them be assigned as that job uh makes it so cecil's arc has more weight because if you kept the job system of final fantasy 3 where you're just able to switch between like a monk and a bard or whatever mm -hmm. whenever you want then cecil changing from a dark knight to a paladin would be meaningless yeah good point exactly yeah i never thought of it like that <laughs> yeah but then again you haven't played like ff3 where you can just change jobs on the fly so yeah i've i i mean this being like the only traditional final fantasy that i have i understand what you're talking about but it is so over my head in terms of like the <laughs> job systems all i know is like the different mages and stuff like that. Yeah. Essentially. Right, is that what in, you're talking about? Yeah, those are what oh, okay. jobs are. So oh, okay. Final Fantasy okay. 3, 5, uh, you can, it has a job system where essentially you, any of your characters can be any jobs. And then they take up that role. It, it, it allows for experimentation and gameplay. But you can't really tell a story as well with something like that. Yeah. Whereas in Final strange. Fantasy IV, yeah, obviously you have the huge um, paladin moment on Mount Ordeals, mm -hmm. which wouldn't have been effective if you could just switch to it at any point. It's kind of embedded into the story of four. Yeah. Y it yeah. The, <clears throat> sorry. The, char the characters' jobs are meant to be reflective of a certain aspect of their character, and that's also kind of a reason why in Final Fantasy II. Uh, the very freeform nature of the the, uh, the character building and growth systems, uh, Fury and Maria, Guy and Leon, they're meant to be 
blank canvases pretty much, but mm -hmm. they all they kind of lean towards a particular direction if you look at their stats right at the beginning, but you can change that just through play. So trying to give them certain personalities, but then letting you kind of just do whatever you want, paint whatever you want on the canvas that is their character or lack thereof, it it it, it would be pretty clashing. You wouldn't really have characters at that point. You would basically just have a starting point. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can't really tell a compelling character arc with that, at least not in an easy way. With Final Fantasy III, uh, it was it was textually dispensed with, uh, but there is subtext there, which I've gone into elsewhere. And with Final Fantasy IV, everyone's jobs inform an aspect of their character. You know, Rose is the white mage. She's a very caring person. Rydia is a summoner and a black maid. She has a bit of a she has a bit of a temper, and there's that tremendous power kind of bubbling beneath the surface. Uh, Kane is a dragoon. He's you know technically uh, a knight for Baron. There is an, an, a component of honor there, but by not showing his face, you know you're not seeing his eyes. The eyes are the window to the soul. There's something to be hidden there, and that's his affection for Rosa and his jealousy. Uh, towards Cecil, etc., etc., etc. Which, not to get too spoilery, it's probably also a window for him to be manipulated as well, like his darkness, right, by Golbez. At least I would look at it like that. Golbez! <clears throat> Mr. Golbez? Yes. Mr. Golbez, <laughs> Mr. Golbez, I have those reports you asked for. I'm just imagining Golbez just like in a tie and like just like a collar <laughs> yeah. in an office environment. Yeah. <laughs> Give funny. me the gold coins. <laughs> all your coins, all your crystals. Yeah, I you just have them. Yeah, if you could just have those reports on my desk by six, that'd be great. <laughs> that'd be great, Kane. Thank you. And the crystal, please. Thanks. Um, okay, so I guess now we'll get into gameplay. Now that we have that stuff covered, so Fred, why don't you uh, lead us? We'll talk about version differences as they come up, um, because there are a lot of them in when it comes to gameplay. And honestly, translation and story too that I'm not super knowledgeable on, uh, but I know there are some differences there. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, why don't you lead us off? <clears throat> we have such a different experience because you played the 2D pixel remaster. I played the 3D yeah. version. Yeah, there is. Uh, there are quite a bit of differences um i don't remember ever having such an infuriating time playing a game <laughs> uh, i yeah. was not privy to having to learn on the fly how to beat a boss also mm -hmm. there's like certain things that are embedded in final fantasy games or i don't know if it's jrpg games in general like you heal zombies to make them die what is what is that <laughs> I, that's it's, crazy it, it, it's because they're they're undead so like yeah yeah so if you, you healing them would bring them to life therefore they'd be no longer undead so they would die like yeah. like, like basically it's... like if if you die when your <laughs> hp hit zero you can think of like undead enemies as having like negative hp mm -hmm. sort of so if you try to restore that HP to zero, then they just keel over. Like, yeah, it's a yeah. very abstract thing. But otherwise, you can just shoot them with fire. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that, that's consistent yeah. across Final Fantasies. Yeah. So I was um, I did not know that beforehand. Um, I the only thing I have to go off of is Final Fantasy VII remake. And I feel like they flushed out a lot of like the ATB stuff. Um, a lot of it just feels like more of a streamlined experience. I know it's much different, but that's mm. I, I prefer the way that the newer system is laid out. It's a little bit more free flowing, um, not so structured. I like a lot of the story points. Uh, after uh, I wrote down after about four streams, I started resenting the game thoroughly <laughs> uh, oh my because, God. <laughs> and how m a lot of the story points kind of like left my brain just because I was, you know, I was not in the happiest state of mind going through it. Yeah, if you're not enjoying yourself, it's hard to like immerse yourself into what's going on in the story. 
for sure. It was it was a very specific moment. It was the dark elf boss battle. Oh. I <laughs> I think I got to 32 tries. I was extremely <laughs> under leveled. I didn't know I was yeah. like 10 levels under where you should be. <laughs> um I was so yeah. weak. I just died immediately. I couldn't do anything. <laughs> And then I had to back out of it, go throughout the dungeon again, grind some levels, and then go back. I was like, "This, who thought of this? This is silly." Yeah. <laughs> what's what's uh, your exp- uh, your gameplay experience, Juice? Well, to I think my gameplay experience was perfectly fine up until the the very end of the game. I actually dis- didn't like the the boss, the the final boss, and Thank the lead you. up to it. Yeah. Um, Is it the same boss? All, yeah, it's the same okay. boss, and okay. it's just ten minutes of cutscenes leading up to it. And <laughs> when you, w- it's the only point in the game I actually had to grind right before, which isn't a bad thing in itself. But it was like, mm-hmm. okay, I go up to the boss. I, there's like very little strategy to it, as opposed to some of the other bosses, which I found True. really weird. Um, it was just like it has a really strong attack. It gets rid of all your status stuff and kills you in like one or two hits and so the only solution that i had to this was to grind and i lost to it like four times so it was just like okay 10 minutes of cutscenes. let's do a second attempt okay i'm exaggerating on 10 minutes but you know what i mean it was like i don't want to have to wait that long before retrying a, a boss to try to see what the strategy is but there was never any strategy it was just get stronger so i really didn't like that uh, but other than that, my gameplay experience was really, really good. Um, I think there's something to be said about, you know, this being your first JRPG mm-hmm. as well. Um, and I think, you know, when Final Fantasy IV released or Final Fantasy II in the U.S., it came with a, a huge player guide, right, of breaking down a lot of these mechanics to you. But you didn't have that. And that's really important for a first-time JRPG goer, uh, for sure. But also... I want to say that the game also tries to explain some of this stuff to you in towns. It does. I think, yeah, I think like if you talk to specific people, they'll give you those tips, which is always, always good to know. Cause I remember like during your playthrough, I was explaining like, okay, this is what back row and front row does, which is essential. If you don't know what that is, mm-hmm. then like you're going to get smacked, and especially with ambushes and back attacks. And, and I like, did. W- yeah. And then there's the ATB system, which after Andrew talks about his gameplay experience with, I think it's going to be a, a good thing for us to go over because it's really, really important. Extremely uh, so Andrew, important. Why don't you uh, go on? I had a reasonably solid gameplay experience uh, with Final Fantasy IV. Now, I played four versions of the game. <clears throat> um, the Super Famicom version by, uh, by way of uh, the Naming Way edition so I had a much better script than we got here in North America, and I didn't have to miss out on any abilities that were cut here initially. So I had the full proper game. Uh, then I did the PSP version, which is basically just a graphically enhanced version of the Game Boy Advance version. Uh, the 3D version on PC, and then the Pixel Remaster. And of all of those... Honestly, I think the PSP version is the best. It's it's snappy. It's got that... Uh, I believe it's got an auto battle on there to keep things moving just that bit faster. Uh, it doesn't feel as... It doesn't feel terribly difficult. There's some good end game stuff that also isn't terribly difficult that actually does help flesh out the characters a little bit. Particularly Kane. Uh, But I also had problems with the final boss. I had to play it a few times uh, just because, uh, like you said, there's not... There is a strategy to it, but the strategy is almost inconsequential. It's basically just hit him when he... uh, When he has his tail, when he does a little shake, so that way his big bang Mm. attack does slightly less damage. I d- okay, I didn't even know that. I yeah, didn't. I mean, it's, it's something that you're going to do anyway, pretty much. Yeah. So it's not really, it's hardly worth knowing. The only other thing is don't use summons or black magic on it because it's just That gonna, I learned. Yeah, it's just going to counterattack and mess you up. 
And yeah. then uh, the other strategy I learned firsthand is just like, let Rydia die. She's not going to help. Mm -hmm. Just let her die. Bringing her back up is just going to waste time and resources when you could just be doing damage. Really? Yep. I didn't even know that because I, I didn't have any of my characters die during that fight. Did you have an easy time with the final boss? Yeah. Or? I was extremely overleveled. I got to, I think oh, Cecil okay. was 74 or some silly number. I think I, I think of <laughs> the you were level version, 80. I think of the 3D version, I got him to like somewhere in the 60s. I don't know if I got him quite to the 70s, but... <laughs> Fred, I, you were level 80 with one of your characters. Was Jeez. I? I know that. You know, yeah, I, I'm, I'm I look didn't want... Steam achievements, because... <laughs> I didn't want to die at all. I was like, I'm going to just finish this game. Okay, I ha <laughs> I did get Cecil to 70, according to my Steam achievements for it. But uh, and the thing is, too, is I, I was aware of the difficulty of the 3D version mm -hmm. and that it was toned down if you select normal on the PC version. And so I did select normal. And I won't, I won't say I hated it, but that the reason I didn't hate it wasn't because of the gameplay. It was because of the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I can agree with that. My, the thing is, with Final Fantasy IV, when I first finished it, I thought, you know, that was a bit better than three. Uh, pretty much my experience with uh, playing through them in order, the original versions of these games in order, was each game felt better than the last until Final Fantasy VIII. Oh, I cannot agree with Final Fantasy II over one. <laughs> I mean, like that. But, that's just, I mean, that's just my personal opinion. I, yeah, I got you. I and that, got you. and that was in the moment. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so, like, maybe, like, depending on the weather, which the weather is kind of gloomy right now because you know it's winter. <laughs> it's winter, and it's in Florida. We don't get snow. We just get overcast. <laughs> I feel. Uh, it. Um. So, like, you know, depending on the weather, you know, I might say one is better than two, or two is better than one, but. Like when it came to three versus four, I've really flip flopped on it because with three, the story is very subtle and possibly unintentional. Like I like the coming of age story I thought was really yeah, interesting in up. three. Mm -hmm. Um and then and also I know this is the Final Fantasy Four episode, but I'm just gonna say my piece on this because I know someone will bring it up in the comments. Mm -hmm. Uh I do not like the three D remake of three. That uh, adds things that do not need to be there and go nowhere. You uh, either commit or don't. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, with three, I like three's gameplay more than four because four, playing through it four times in a row, well, three times in a row, but, you know, playing it four times in relatively quick succession, there's not much replay value to it. And that That's the biggest sticking point I have against four. Once you've when when you've played it once, when you've played any version once, there's not much re well except for the 3D version. I think that's worth a shot if you've only played the 2D yeah. version and vice versa. <clears throat> uh, there there's not much variety to it, you know. And most playthroughs are going to be the same unless you're big on super bosses and post game content, because then you can play the bonus stuff in the GBA and PSP versions. You got bonus content on uh, New Game Plus in the 3D version, which I did not do. And only one person gave me flack for that. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Um, <laughs> just saying your piece with them. <laughs> and just it, it's whatever. Like I was yeah. on, I, like that. That came down to a multitude of things, but that's beside the point. Um, Final Fantasy four is solid. I like how a lot of the bosses feel like puzzles. What I don't like, yeah. and here's a segue, is the ATB system in this game. Okay. The 3D or the 2D, or are they similar? Yes. Uh, they're more they're, or less the same. They're the okay. same. The okay. only difference is that uh, the augment system is only in the 3D version. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I had no idea what they were in your playthrough, and I was like... Huh. And you know what? Just just before we go into ATB, we're already talking about some of these version differences. Before I forget them, I just want to say that um, the augment system is probably a pretty good reason for replayability if you played the 3D versions along with their harder difficulty. Yeah. Because it, you can give uh, different abilities to different characters and the way that they use them is different. 
Um, mm. So, for example, I never had twin cast or dual cast or half the stuff that you had that you were able to teach those characters. Yeah. That seems really interesting to me. So, like, it, you know, I went from the Pixel Remaster. Now, next time I play the game, I would want to play, like, 3D hard mode with the augments. You know what I mean? That would be a huge difference. The only problem is I want the quality of life that the Pixel Remaster gives me. If I want to turn off random encounters... Oh, in a dungeon for like two seconds just to backtrack then i want to do that um <laughs> or if i have to like seriously grind for something let me turn yeah. exp to 4x or yeah. something although, although it you should know be, it should be noted that only the console versions of the pixel remasters have those boosters the pc version yeah does not. so stupid i i hate it but i was i was complaining so much about a lot of that stuff in my Final Fantasy 1 and 2 podcasts and then they fixed it for the console ports um, including text it's not as good as the modded text you can do on PC no. but it's decent it's decent yeah. it's better than the Arial font um, <laughs> and but it's only for consoles they only have those boosters for consoles which sucks that's stupid yeah I'm sorry Square come it's on it's weird that they would have a difference between the PC it, it, it's the same port of the game, right? Well, well, they came out. The console version came out later. They came out earlier this year, as opposed to 2021. Okay. So, yeah. so the console ports were made with feedback to the PC and mobile versions in mind. Yeah, but it's not as if they couldn't patch it. I don't. Yeah, I don't yeah. understand. Simple little update. Um, the the but, lead the lead on the <clears throat> pixel remasters he did an interview shortly after the console versions came out saying i do want these improvements on the pc and mobile versions but it's not up to me oh, okay mm. i see yeah that always that makes sucks. sense it's always like corporate yeah. um but just to close that off i want to say that those quality of life improvements for someone like you fred where it's your first jrpg and you want to experience these games i feel like those are really important things uh at least in my eyes as far as just being welcoming to the genre in these old nintendo and super nintendo games especially for final fantasy 2 oh my god those yeah. dungeons you need <laughs> random counters off yeah. i didn't have that when i played them because i played it on pc but geez louise if you want to have fun with that game <laughs> at least in it, my opinion it, it's even worse <laughs> on the original famicom version i heard yeah, yeah which like you know even like just playing that version after the famicom version of one i still thought it was better but apparently i'm the crazy one <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and i'm sure other version differences might come up later um but with that being said yeah let's talk about atp combat one of the biggest combat systems in turn-based JRPG history ever, and it all started with Final Fantasy IV. Um, I love ATB. It is my favorite turn-based combat system, um, and I love its inclusion in Seven Remake too, which is my favorite combat system. Period. Uh, I, I I don't really know where to begin with this, other than just explaining what it is. So, in Final Fantasy One through Three. Um, Basically, it's classic turn-based battle system where your enemy gets a turn and then each of you get a turn. Um, but with ATB, both you and your enemy have a bar. And once that bar fills over time is when you get to make that move. Um, which allows for not only better strategizing, because if a character's ATB bar is finished charging, you don't necessarily have to use them. You can move on to the next one. Um, which means you can line up specific attacks or combos or like reviving and then healing, which is something I got really frustrated at in previous Final Fantasies because you're not able to do that. Um, <clears throat> but it also adds a, a an active element to it where you can't just sit there and wait. It's an actual battle, right? It, it is as it says it is. Um, if you just sit there, the enemy's going to kill you, right? So you have to it forces you to be very in the moment, right? So, yeah, before I keep rambling, someone else can, can go on on ATB. I can continue with that a little bit. Um, <laughs> sure. This is like the first real experience with it. I think Final Fantasy VII Remake does it a lot differently. 
Uh, it well, at least it feels a lot different. This one felt so momentum based. This um, I felt like I had to get my timing right almost perfectly just to beat some of these like harder bosses, and I had to get into like a rhythm. It was <clears throat> very different from any experience I've ever had with a video game. I yeah. uh, I liked it though. I thought it was an interesting aspect, but I I mean, it, it yeah, it was a cool combat system, just different. I like the ATB system. I think it is a nice shot in the arm for traditional turn-based combat, uh, and it's something that a lot of people who haven't played Final Fantasies four through nine have trouble grasping until they actually play it. Mm -hmm. Its implementation in Final Fantasy IV, you know, this is the first implementation of ATB. I think that it, the the big detraction to it for me is the charge up time on casting magic. You know, like if you're trying to cast like uh, Bolt Three or Thundaga, as it's known in later versions. You know, the more powerful the magic you're trying to cast, like it's not going to just instantly add that character casting that spell to the the action queue as it were uh, as soon as you submit the commands no it they take their time to charge first which in the pixel remaster they actually do have like the meter show that it's charging mm -hmm. and then once it's charged then they're added to the queue and it, it's <laughs> it's it's like you can't it's hard to predict that especially yeah. when you mm -hmm put the ATB system on wait so that whenever you're in one of these sub menus time stops so the enemies aren't going to attack you while you're trying to find a spell or an item which I recommend for first timers all the time um, because it, it turns it into something a little more turn based a little more pure turn based um, that, that's, that's the big that's, that, that really is the big negative for me is just that okay I want uh, I want Rydia to use Thundaga, but it's going to be like a whole nother round of everyone doing stuff before she'll actually cast it. And that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's like, come on, I, that's, yeah, I understand it. I understand it's like, you don't, don't want them to just get it off immediately, but it, it is a frustrating thing because then you're not quite sure when it's going to go off. Unless yeah. you really internalize that kind of stuff and you're really paying the most minute attention. But at the same time, you have five party members, the only Final Fantasy game that has you to controlling five, five people. Right. <clears throat> so the gameplay gets a lot more hectic as a result because you're having to keep track of more characters. Yeah. So I won't it say it's bad, but it is. it can be overwhelming and a little bit frustrating. It's how it's, many? Uh, it's oh, I'm sorry. What's your question? I was gonna say how many of the Final Fantasy games have done five characters? Is this the only one? It's the only one. Just this. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, what I was gonna say is that I think the ATB system is great, except for exactly what you brought up, uh, which is just poor game language. There's no reason why, and they don't do it ever again, to my knowledge. They don't. Right? Once, once they go to five. I th they either get rid of that delay or they turn it way yeah. the hell down. It makes no sense because the game is telling you once this happens, this happens, and you're getting used to that stimuli. So mm. when, if it, except for sometimes, right? So it's like you'll never really know, and that's just bad game language. Yeah, especially with you guys both had ATB bars in the versions you played. In the original Super Famicom version, you don't get an ATB meter. Mm -hmm. You just you just wait until the menu pops up and that's how you know you're going to go. You can press select mm. to change like your HP totals into uh, like a percentage that goes from 0% to 25% to 50 to 75 to just the menu popping up. But you're losing information for that. Like, pretty yeah. critical information for that. And thankfully, it's the only game of the ATB era to do that. And every subsequent uh, version of the game, with the exception of the PlayStation version and, like, just straight re-releases of that original version, uh, to not have a visible ATB meter 
five had it, six had it, seven, eight, nine, they all had it. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so the <coughs> so it's the original Super Nintendo port and the PlayStation port that just didn't have it. Uh, yeah, because the PlayStation version is just a straight port of the Super Famicom Super Nintendo okay. version. Yeah. Interesting. Um, but yeah, the ATB system, it's just, it's such an evolution in strategizing in battles. And like the fact that you couldn't really choose which character goes next in the line. You know what I mean? That, that always kind of stunk before um before atb and just having the pressure on me to keep up to date and in the moment in those battles is something that i find to keep me engaged you know um i i think it's a wonderful system even with that flaw it it made me have so much fun in the battle system in this game um other than the oh real quick um the switch port of these pixel remasters in this game especially the battle system isn't as snappy as we'd like it to be because even though you would think that a pixel remaster of a super famicom game would run smoothly it does not <laughs> so there's a literal delay in the menus because there's five characters so that's really good. I just wanted to say that it's it's the worst in Final Fantasy IV Pixel Remaster on Switch. I'd imagine, yeah. <clears throat> I didn't bring it up in my FF6 video, but the FF6 Pixel Remaster has some uh, noticeable stuttering as well. Like instead of the menu just cleanly fading out as it moves to the side, like it'll kind of jump as it's fading out. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't bring it out because, like, you know, reasons, but you know, just. It's it's just one of those things you notice. It, it doesn't destroy the experience, but it's you you don't not notice it. Yeah, I definitely noticed it. I would say it took away. It didn't d ruin my experience with Final Fantasy IV's battle system, but it definitely took away from it because menuing wasn't smooth. It wasn't as smooth as it should have been. Right. You know what I mean? Like in battles, yeah. that that does matter, and especially in ATB. It's not like it's turn based. You got to be fast. I apologize. So, like, there's some banging going on, like in the next apartment or something. <laughs> oh, I couldn't. I couldn't even hear it. Yeah, I can't like, even I, hear it either. It, it was. It, it was just <laughs> picking up on Discord, and I was just like, "What the heck?" So <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's all right. Um. All right. So, Friedrich, you had experience with this. Why don't you break down what augments are? If you, I. Th I think augments are the abilities that you gather from characters that you've played as in the past and that you learn their abilities. I think that's what it is. Uh, am I correct? I, I think, yeah. Didn't you get like key items and then you were able to yes. just give those to whoever? You could transfer them to any character of your choice, but you kind of had to be strategic because you only had the one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The only... The only ones I know of are like the dual cast and mm -hmm. that you got from the uh, the twins, um, Palom and Parom. Is that who you get them from? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, Palom and Parom. Yeah. Okay. That's how you say it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I said it wrong the whole time. <laughs> it, it's their text space, and I don't even think they oh, okay. say their names in like the voiced cutscenes in the 3D version. So I don't believe so. Yeah, which I, I, I was calling I, I, Cecil. Oh, oh sorry. no, I, I call him Cecil. Cecil is how it's supposed to be pronounced. Like they they say that in Dissidia. Yeah, no, I usually you call him Cecil, Cecil at first. <laughs> yeah, because I have a I I have a person that I work with called his name is Cecil, and it's spelled that exact yeah. way. Yeah, be, and yeah. I just got <laughs> just like side, just like sideshow Bob's brother. Yeah, by David High Pierce. Because it's just a big old <laughs> Frasier reference. Yeah. Uh, I used are cool. I used I used one augment in the three D version. It was um I can't remember the name. I know I'm pretty sure it wasn't cover, because that's like just one of Cecil's regular things. It's default. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh one where you No no, it was draw attack that I had. Um which I thought was going to be like the Viking in like the 3D version of FF3 or something oh, I might yeah. be misremembering where you use the command 
Yeah, I thought it was gonna be like Vikings provoke. Yeah, and they the, they yeah the, provoke right. Yeah, where it's just like come <clears throat> get me. Um, mm -hmm. but no, it was like a it was a passive augment. So when you had it equipped, enemies would just go to Cecil anyway. Like you didn't have to like hit a command; they would just do it. So for like half of the game, I was just like, man, why do all the enemies hate <laughs> Cecil? Because I forgot I equipped it. And then right at the mm -hmm. end, I realized, oh, I'm an idiot. I put it on Kane. <laughs> That's okay. That's why they kept attacking Kane. They only attacked Kane, yeah, because oh I gave my him. God. The, I buffed him pretty heavily with the gold and silver apples. Mm. Okay, that's a good a good strat. Then I didn't I didn't understand why that was happening when I was yeah. watching you. I was like, you have really bad luck. They some, hate some, him. <laughs> some, something funny you can do is on New Game Plus if you save your silver apples. Uh, then when you get Tella in your party after he learns Meteor, you can use Silver Apples on him so that you have enough MP for him to cast Meteor. Oh, okay. So oh. you'll just completely break the reason why he doesn't have enough MP oh my to gosh. do it. That's <laughs> really. Yeah, I mean, like, That's he, I mean, like, yeah, like in <clears throat> gameplay at that point, you'll he can cast Meteor and he yeah. will die like he does in the story. But you know that that does create that uh, that does destroy that separation of uh, game mechanic yeah. and uh, and narrative, which was very very clever. Uh, yeah, I think was that presented. was really well done in this game. Actually, I yeah. think that's one of the strongest qualities of the game. Yeah, using uh, game mechanics and game language to support and facilitate the narrative. You know, Cecil going from Dark Knight to Paladin. Tella not being able to use Meteor or else he'll die. You know, it's it's a lot of little things that uh, mm -hmm. that make Final Fantasy IV a lot richer than one would suspect. Or the petrification too. Oh yeah, that's a R. big R. one. <clears throat> Just taking those mechanics and turning them into story. I love it. I love it. Okay. Um, but th those augments would definitely be. I I think for those who played 3D definitely a good reason to replay it just to throw them on new characters and stuff that's so cool to me and because it's like and from what i understand they're pretty essential if you're going to do a hard mode playthrough or just play on the original ds version of it because mm -hmm. of just like the insane difficulty yeah like having omnicast for example cast blink on everyone in the party which is really important for like behemoth fights and stuff that's kind of um, broken for behemoth <clears throat> fights yeah that's great i yeah i did not get that or twin casting putting that on Rydia, doing two firagas or whatever that'd be a mm -hmm. lot of damage you know okay cool um let's talk about difficulty balancing then um so for me the game it it had a challenge to it for me even like going into it as someone who's experienced multiple games with ATB and knowing everything that was going on I played on active obviously um I it, like and there were still multiple times where the bosses really tripped me up and I I had to I had like I had to do them like three or four times or something uh, I'd never okay I don't want to say I never grinded I think there were a couple times where I think I grinded for a, a few levels like spoilers when Kane becomes a paladin I didn't want to be level when, one when so Cecil I grinded a paladin yeah Cecil yeah, did I not say Cecil? You said Kane. Kane. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When Kane becomes a paladin, and maybe when after Cecil becomes years? a paladin. <laughs> oh, I, don't no. know, I don't know if you were riffing <laughs> on yourself there, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wasn't. That's the problem. My brain isn't working. I wish they made Kane into a paladin at the end, but no, yeah, he, he goes to no, Mount Ordeals to no, maybe well, become one. Well, he well he gets he gets blonde hair, you know, close enough. Maybe yeah. in maybe in the after years he does. I don't know. I haven't played after years. I haven't played after Same. years either. So for those of you who know after years, please let us know what what happens there. For those mm. of you who have played after years, tell us why we shouldn't play after years. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard that. good things about it. No, I've heard pretty bad things. Mostly how like the episodic story structure leads to a lot of stuff not really building to anything, and then just kind of there's a blitz of nothing at the end or something. I don't know. I've heard it. I've heard it's bad. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't even know what I was talking about. Oh, yeah, the difficulty the balancing. balancing. Yep. Right. Other than, like, I was talking about grinding. There were only a couple times where I, I felt like, okay, I'll grind, like, a few levels with my characters because one person is, like, 
rather under leveled compared to the rest of my party. Um, other than that, the only difficulty balancing problem I had was toward the end of the game, like I brought up earlier. Um, I feel like the game does a really, really good job at challenging you with the mechanics that it's taught you in its mm -hmm. boss fights. Like, the fact that even the, the very first boss fight, oh, what is it, Mist Dragon? Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, where like, <clears throat> the game tells you, literally tells you, you go to hit it and then it becomes Mist. And if you hit it, it, it counterattacks with a powerful attack. And the game's like, don't do that, stupid. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> and then you do it again. <laughs> Uh, it's the same thing that Final Fantasy VII does. I like to start with the Guard Scorpion, for Ex example. Except with Final Fantasy VII, <laughs> the uh, the the localization got screwed up. Where it's like, where it says Cloud, attack the Stinger, and it'll <laughs> counterattack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It says attack while the tail is up, and you're supposed to say don't attack while the tail is up. I mean, it says it says attack, but that's because it's only the first part of the message. The second part is. And it'll counterattack or something along those oh, lines. So right, right, it's right, telling right, right. you not to do it, but because of the delay and it's splitting the message in two, it it starts. It's seeming like a suggestion before telling <laughs> yeah. you, no, don't do that. So it's like, ugh. the trolling yeah. you. Oh man, that's that's it, tough. It, it wasn't intentional. It was just it was just a quirk of the localization, which. Final Fantasy VII's localization is a rabbit hole. Is no, well, not a rabbit hole. It's uh, definitely something I'm not looking forward to talking about because, <laughs> yeah, like there are problems with it. I think people harp on it too much. But besides, mm -hmm. besides we're getting off topic. Besides, the point, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it's letting you know that in battles, time passes, mm -hmm. and the way to do that is literally all you have to do is wait. The boss has an AT. B bar of its of its own. It's teaching you about counterattacks, which is a huge thing in the battle system in this game, uh, more so than any other Final Fantasy so far, I think. Um, <clears throat> so all you do is you wait for it to turn back into a dragon, then you start attacking it again. And in the 3D version, when you go to attack that like spider thing in the cave, um, or is it I the ant lion? So, I don't yeah, remember the yeah. name. The ant lion, like when you have Edward and Rydia. Yeah. Um, you in the 2D version, this didn't happen, at least to my knowledge. But in the 3D version, you're supposed to use magic attacks on it when its eye is like red and physical when its eye is blue, teaching you like the differences. Yes, um, that was the 3D version, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like continuing to build on those mechanics. <coughs> I think I actually that tripped like me the 3D up a lot version for that reason. That was that the first boss. Uh, one of the first bosses? No, I think it was the third. <clears throat> yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, the first one was Miss Dragon, then it was like that okay. octopus mm -hmm. or squid or whatever it is with when you have Tella and then the ant lion. Okay. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. they uh that one definitely tripped me up because you actually had to tell me what was going on. I don't think I was paying attention enough. I thought I could just like spam attacks and get through it, but that does not work in this game. No, definitely didn't get, not. Didn't get me anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Got me so, to restart but, it. But I, I really like how the battle system teaches you the mechanics uh, and the ATB system. I think it does a, a pretty good job, personally. It does. So. You want to give um, your piece on the balancing, Andrew? Yeah, I think that... It really helps that because you can't swap out party members, that who is in your party is based on where you are in the story. Mm. Random encounters in an area and the boss fights that you're facing, they are finely tuned to exactly what the developers knew you were going to have available to you. Mm -hmm. Unlike Final Fantasies 1, 2, and 3, where they kind of had to broadly... Uh, make well it, one and two at least where they kind of had to broadly make it so like they were beatable by general means even though in two you could kind of just do whatever and with three they were able to kind of balance it however they wanted because hey they can just switch to a dragoon to take on garula or garuda bird mm -hmm. um <clears throat> which you know that's kind of a mark against final fantasy 3 to uh to a lot of people for understandable reasons because in a game where 
you can change your job archetype or you, or you can change your job and change your skill set whenever you want let the player express themselves don't funnel them down a particular play style for chunks of the game in final fantasy 4 it's understood that okay these are the tools you're going to be working with here so you're not really missing anything in order to take down this boss you have the tools they know mm -hmm. you have the tools you just have to figure out how to use them yep that's why i like it so much <clears throat> I had a very different experience because yeah, go, I go had, into it. Go into because it because I had such little experience. The frustration was unbearable. I did not understand the difficulty I was getting myself into with this game. I thought I was playing the same version as you. I had no <laughs> clue. I just typed into Steam. Final Fantasy 4 and I bought the first one that I could find and that oh, was no. the one I got so yeah. Uh, yeah I got myself into a bit of a hole and I had to learn my way out of it I you kept telling me you can go do the the remaster if you want because you saw how frustrated I was getting um, yeah but I wanted to see it through <laughs> because I <laughs> I paid I wanted for the whole yeah. game I'm playing the whole game <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I was like, I, I gotta get uh I shouldn't say my money's <laughs> worth out of it because I got more than that. Um I just had no experience with any of these battling systems because it is so different from what I'm used to. Most of what I've been playing is Zelda games, and it is totally different. There or is like no your resemblance. Only experience with turn bases like Pokemon, right? So it's like I haven't played a Pokemon since Pokemon X. But even even still, like yeah. that's your experience with a lot of the turn-based yeah. battle systems, which is completely different. It doesn't ask nearly as much. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the you. thing the thing with Pokemon too. This is a little bit of a sidebar, but I think it's something very interesting that a lot of people don't consider when talking about uh, turn-based games. Obviously, I'm sure you two are both very aware that a lot of people uh, are very averse to turn-based games. Like you suggest something. Like, mm -hmm. a, like an old school Final Fantasy or like, hey, you just played Final Fantasy 7 Remake. Well, the original Final Fantasy 7 is really good. But then they say, oh, I don't like turn based games. You know, a lot of people don't consider that there is uh, a disconnect that uh, with the uh, level of abstraction there, uh, how people who are attuned to these games already, they don't really think of it as I'm telling these characters what to do. I am not, I am an impartial force. No, it's, we don't really think of it like that. We just understand it as inherent to the genre more or less with a lot, with other people who have this aversion to turn-based games. They don't look at it as, okay, I'm strategizing here. I'm taking my time and I'm getting really nitty gritty with it. They look at it as I'm not playing as these characters. I am just telling them what to do. Oh, I see where you're going with yeah, this. There's that disconnect mm -hmm. a lot of people have. But the one exception <clears throat> is almost always Pokemon because that disconnect actually gels with the fiction, with the actual, uh, not mechanics, but the, uh, well, like I said, the fiction. It gels with the presentation of the game where when you're playing Pokemon, you are not playing as the Pokemon. You are the trainer and you are issuing commands to the Pokemon in battle, so right. that disconnect isn't quite there because it gels with what a lot of people who usually have this aversion to turn-based systems already see turn-based systems to uh, as. Yeah, so, yeah, that's yeah. that's a great point. I hadn't considered that. Oh, I didn't either. Going as soon as you brought it up, but yeah. I was like, oh, that's really smart. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people don't think about that, which mm -hmm. is a shame because... Uh, when it comes because like I, I understand the disconnect and I understand that turn-based systems were born not of a stylistic desire not because wouldn't it be cool if you took turns or not even necessarily because of the genres roots in tabletop RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons but just because of technical necessity like that that's yeah. how that's how we got that so obviously as we moved further and further away from that there have been fewer and fewer people interested in it 
and there have been fewer developers willing to invest a lot of time and money into it into that it's why final fantasy has moved away from it because it's it doesn't really have that mass market appeal unless it's pokemon and that's you know because the disconnect is already kind of worked around in the fiction and because of brand rec uh, brand recognition right yeah and it's it's a shame because well you can't like objectively compare one battle system to another between pokemon and final fantasy but if you like pokemon games then I feel like you might actually, you know, if that's the only thing stopping you, do you not enjoy the battle system itself? Like, because if you do, wouldn't you want to play one that asks more of you, of your of your brain power? Exactly. You know? There are a lot of people it, now, yeah. you know, ever since the <clears throat> Dexic controversy with uh, Sword and Shield, who just are relentless, or even, you know, going back a bit further with like X and Y and how much easier the games have become, which... The games have always been easy. They're they're children's games. Yes. Yeah. But let's not let's not kid ourselves. I love Pokemon, but I know what it is. Um, yeah. Like, well ask said. them. Like, do they like Pokemon? Do they like the battle system? Do they wish it was deeper? Do they not like the battle system? Do they just like that it's cute creatures? Like, like once like you interrogate what it is they like about Pokemon, like, like get them to really ask that, like. If you stripped away the formalities of the cre the cute creatures and the trainer, would they still enjoy the gameplay loop? Mm -hmm. No. It's just, maybe. That, that's <laughs> maybe, why you gotta maybe. ask. Yeah. That's why, yeah. That's why you gotta ask. Because, because Pokemon is a stripped down version of a stripped down version of a stripped down version of a system. It's a stripped down version of Dragon Quest, which Dragon Quest, which itself is a stripped down version of games like Wizardry and Ultima, which itself is a stripped down version of Dungeons and Dragons, which itself is a stripped down version of old tabletop war games. Yeah, that's stripped down to the bone. <laughs> Damn, Pokemon, put some clothes on. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. <laughs> Gardevoir, what are you doing? Gardevoir, Lopany, what the hell? Vaporeon. <laughs> yeah. Stop. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, I, yeah I, I've had Pokemon. Oh, God damn it. I, it just hit. <laughs> I've had that on the brain for a minute because, like, I'm doing soul links with my friend right now. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and, like, uh, like I'm, I'm that guy. It's like, guys, please try it out. Please, like, please. Mm -hmm. You will yeah. enjoy it. Like you will, you will, you will find something here. Please, right? Totally. Um, it's hard to go back to playing Pokemon games for me after experiencing games like Final Fantasy VII and Nine, because I I I think I seek for more complex battle systems. Even when when I play Pokemon now, it's doing so like smug on competitive six v six stuff. Oh, I don't um, play. I don't play smug on singles. I play VGC. I was I I, I, tr I, I tried it. I tried. I was it. at Orlando <clears throat> Regionals this year. It's it's a fun oh, time. Nice. That's cool. Nice. I tried VGC. Um, but it's so different season to season that I don't know what I would actually enjoy or not enjoy. Yeah. But that's a conversation for a yeah. different day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. That being said, um, what do you guys think about the item usage in this game? I know that's a very minute topic, but... It is. So minute, there's not much to say. <laughs> yeah. I, I brought it up mainly because I think there are differences um, in how this game t handles or like how each game handles like ethers and elixirs specifically um i want to know like well i guess the difference between an ether and a dry ether is that's that a dry ether does it heals more mp yeah it right? does yeah ethers are just like really really rare i find um uh -huh. <clears throat> and i'm i literally almost 100 percent explored every single dungeon um i feel like you could only buy them at what the very very end of the game yeah, I, I actually didn't know this until like right at the end of working on my video. Uh, it's the Hummingway, the Hummingway home. It's on, on the moon, the, yeah. Yeah, on the moon. Like mm -hmm. that's where you can mm -hmm. buy like ethers and such. And yeah. I, I played through the game four times without knowing that. <laughs> okay. I only knew that because somebody told me it while I was streaming. <laughs> um, I actually didn't mind it in this case. Because, again, 
the game gives you plenty of places inside the dungeons themselves to use tents, to, yeah. to use tents or whatever, which restore your MP. Um, <clears throat> if you didn't have those, I feel like it would be a much bigger problem. Yeah, and the only reason they had all of those points inside dungeons, they were going to add save points inside of dungeons in Final Fantasy 3, but their playtesters were telling them, nah, this game's like too easy, you don't worry about it. And then they realized the playtesters thought Final Fantasy 3, including its final dungeon, were easy because they played it so much that they just knew it so well. So yeah. then when the feedback to Final Fantasy 3's final dungeon came up, they're like, oh, we screwed up, didn't we? Let's add let's add, let's add <laughs> yeah. these to Final Fantasy 4, like kind of as like a, mm. a reaction to that. And I don't think mm -hmm. that I don't think they overdid it considering how pretty well balanced 4's difficulty is. But uh, it's it's just funny to think about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. And I guess the reason why I like that, in, in in another reason why they can get away with that is like you brought up earlier, you they really knew what what tools you had with what you were tackling, right? The only thing that was kind of stopping you was, do you know how to use those tools or not? And you're going to learn on the fly, um, or are you under leveled because you're running away from fights too much? Yeah, which is something I never did because. I knew because like it doesn't take long. It does add up, but it doesn't take long, and you got to get that sweet, sweet experience. You you have to. You got to yeah, get that. I think, you you got to get that level up juice. Mm hmm. And this is another reason why I would have suggested the pixel remaster to you, Fred, is because it's a lot. The battle system is way faster. It's just snappier than 3D. Plus, can't you? Um, you can boost your how much <clears throat> EXP you get from on the con console version. That yeah, right? on the console yeah. versions. Um, but just moving around faster, mm -hmm. um, the battle system being faster, it makes getting in those random encounters a little bit less, you know, frustrating. The only encounters that I ever really ran away from were um, ambushes and back attacks because. The back attacks were whatever because you can just change the row all at once. Yeah. But ambushes, swap. I'm not dealing with that. I'll see you later. I'll move on to the next encounter, which won't be an ambush, you know. <laughs> Hopefully. Um Yeah. Yeah. I um I thought the <clears throat> items were actually kinda some of them were quite overpowered. Uh I ended up towards endgame getting like a ton of sirens and then grinding on the um it, what is it called the depths for dragons and it, they were so easy to kill and they give you 20,000 XP each so I kind of just leveled up extremely fast through that uh, instead of doing all of the <coughs> random encounters in the last dungeon which gave me a hard time because I, I ran through the last dungeon until the second to last room and then I left to grind because I kept dying repeatedly and then I went back through the whole thing and that's where I got all of the items because uh, juice I didn't even know all these crazy items that you could find like Ragnarok and stuff yeah all the weapons yeah, yeah they're so overpowered if you actually take the time to go through that you can get Ragnarok, you can get, um, uh, what's the, the sword name? That's it's Ragnarok. The one that, the, uh, Are you it's another about the light spear thing? It's, uh, Ma Masamune, it I believe. Cave? Oh, yeah. Masamune. Yeah. That one's good edge. too. Yeah. The light, <clears throat> the light spear is really good. Like the ribbons. I almost oh, yeah. just went right by all of that stuff. Yeah, ribbons are a staple of the series, and they're yeah. always, like, the best accessory, just because, like, they don't always have, like, the best, like, def like defensive boost, but they always have, like, immunity to status effects and such. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, immunity to every it. status. Super yeah, worth it. They are. They absolutely are. Which is, it's, it's the main reason why it's worthwhile to level up Dancer in Final Fantasy V. Hmm. Good to know. I'll note that. <laughs> Um, another thing is th there's just an abundance of different items that you can use in this game mm -hmm. to the point where it can customize your play style a little bit. Like if you ran out of MP, you know, you, it, let's say you did a good job exploring or 
you're not running away from too many encounters. You still have all these items to use spells, like the blue fangs and whatever else. And I think those were, were those introduced in three? I don't think so. I mean, because I know a, a even, lot of them were in three. Even back in FF one, you could use like weapons and such as items to cast spells. Well, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's not exactly new. It's just been like moved to its own bespoke consumables. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's true. I, I know a lot of them were in were like used as consumables in three too. Like bat. What is it? Bachu cider and like her. Bacchus's, Hermes's ba shoes. Ba Bacchus's Bacchus's wine. Yeah, like it's, oh, it's named wine. after the Greek god Bacchus. Okay, okay. And then the shoes to cast haste and Hermes all of shoes. that stuff. Yeah, Hermes shoes. Um, spider silk. I, spider yeah, it's silk. Called. I think that was slow. Uh, yeah, to cast slow, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that you could substitute using some of those things as opposed to spells to reserve your MP, which is why I feel like they did a really good job actually with the amount of ethers and elixirs that they gave you in this game. Because if you mm -hmm. were smart about your item usage, you wouldn't have to worry about it as much. <laughs> you know I wasn't I mean? smart. Something I find very interesting is Cecil is able to equip uh, bows. And because of the way that the row system works in Final Fantasy IV, you can't just individually put characters on the front or back mm -hmm. row. You can only group them in <laughs> groups of three and two. So you can have Cecil either in the front row of the sword or in the back row with a bow and arrow. And because you've got five party members, everyone else, you know, you're going to have two people that work best in the front, two people that work best in the back. So regardless of your party composition, you can have Cecil fill uh, a ranged role or an up-close role. And I find that to be a nice little touch that, you know, it, it's not something most people touch on because why wouldn't you just use your swords? Because it's better. You're probably only going to use it in, like, uh, the Dark Elf's cave because, yeah. you know, you can't have metal. But it, it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice touch, and it is a uh, certainly an appreciated option, even if it's... Uh, one that is underutilized. Mm. I think it's cool too, just because you're tankier and you you uh, you have cover exactly there as well. So that's another strategy to use with Cecil. I didn't good even stuff. Know Cecil I didn't even know use a bow. Yeah, is I, that I never only checked. in the two D? I I'm I, I don't see why it wouldn't be in the three D version. I think I okay. may even have been used it in the three D version. I don't even remember seeing that. It's cool. I, that's a, actually a cool little note. Hmm. Yeah, it's good to know. I, I maybe I'll try that my uh, my next playthrough. No, um, don't do okay. it. Don't do it. You'll try it. Say that's <laughs> neat, and then go back to using the sword. <laughs> yeah, probably. But that's okay. Um, he summons. He just made becomes a, a worse Rosa. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, summons make a, a strong comeback here uh, from from three. Um, specifically, there. <coughs> sorry, there's a really cool thing you can do in this game. There's a little side quest. Um, actually, I'll wait to talk about summons until we get into the story, because there's something that happens there. Um, okay. I think that would be good because it kind of goes more into like the job system and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Um, who wants to start on? exploration both map exploration and dungeon exploration um i kind of put that in uh dungeon design for me uh could i i feel like oh, okay. i could kind of meld those two together I'll, I'll go first um i like the overall designs of them i thought the aesthetic and the music were really unique for all of them really um uh what do you call it I did not, especially in the last one, I did not like how it was set up with a rest only at the very end. That was very stressful for me, especially when I first entered it. Uh, that, uh, But I do admit that the exploration was well compensated in the caves and dungeons especially because if you explored 100 percent, i don't know if it's the same in the 2d but if it's you explore is it if yeah. you explore the whole thing you get specific items for that level 
which I thought was really cool. Uh, they were usually very useful too. Like if if you had a long way to go, sometimes they'll throw you like uh, um, like a long way to go till your next rest period. They would throw you like an ether or a, an elixir, and those sometimes helped keep you going in the moment, which I thought mm -hmm. was really good. They so the loot was was quite good. Um, yeah, it was a little frustrating, but you know yeah. how it goes. I, I tried to fill out the maps whenever I could, but usually, at least in my case, in the 3D version, there would be like a snippet like somewhere that you couldn't quite reach, or it was yeah. just like an area that like you had been past, but it the way that the map was filled in, it was like kind of like in the middle of a big path or something, so it didn't quite read as you missed a spot, some, something like that. So I, I mm -hmm. did fill out a decent number of areas, but nowhere near mm -hmm. all of them. And by the end, I stopped caring about filling in all of them because I'm already pretty stacked here. What else yeah. do I need? Plus, if you have to backtrack, it is such a pain in the neck. Oh, yeah, especially in the 3D version, because yeah. even on normal difficulty, it's it can be pretty tough. Or at the very least, it it feels slow. <laughs> Yeah, it especially because the random, random encounters can't be turned off. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't turn off random encounters in any version before it either, but it's just like, in general, <clears> the 3D <throat> version felt a lot slower, probably because like you're watching characters like move like in full in 3D rather than just mm. seeing like a few frames as they move across a map that's more zoomed out. So I yeah. think that's more I think that's more of a presentational thing but as far as like aesthetically it's very clear that Final Fantasy 4 is an early Super Famicom game because it basically just looks like a more col colorful version of a Famicom game as far as actual design goes it's it's solid you know it the use of color is what uh, really really keeps it on another level from what had come before uh, as well as, well, in the case of interior spaces and dungeons, the more organic sort of, uh, the more organic appearances, the, uh, out, the rocky outcropping, so it's no longer just, like, straight paths, uh, where, uh, like it was in the previous games because of technical restraints. Now everything looks like it's actually, this is a natural rock formation, even though it's still along, cut along the same paths as it was uh, in the older games. So, kudos there. Uh, but it, it's not... For the most part, it's not really anything super crazy outside of aesthetics, uh, which, you know, you run the gamut there. You get some technologically interesting stuff in, like, the Tower of Babel, and then you get, like, the more crystalline sort of deep, dark sort of uh, look in the... Uh, the lunar subterranea but i mean it's it's solid it's it's really solid and a lot of it, it only, rarely does it cap really captivate the imagination but when it does it really does yeah <clears throat> uh one thing i wanted to say was that at least to me it felt like from one two three and then to four it feels like they did a better job of showing a 3d space in the dungeons, even in 2D, like right. the different layers, you that, know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a big difference. That was definitely um, down to the use of color. They had an expanded color palette so they could uh, add, so they could add what looked like shadows to stimulate to uh, simulate depth. Yeah, <clears throat> so that was a big mm -hmm. thing. As far as exploring them, for me, it was really quick to be exploring in the Pixel Remaster on the 2D plane. I also have a map so I can see where pretty much everything is other than the hidden paths. But once I find a hidden path, because I'm checking everything, I you can actually see where they all are exactly. uh, in real time. It almost feels like cheating to a degree, but... Um, at least for me, it incentivized me to literally explore every inch of every floor because I never felt like when I got a chest that it was something I didn't want or didn't need. Um, I felt like every time I went to go get loot, it was worth it. Even though I didn't, I didn't get the rewards like you did for fully completing a map. 
I think mm-hmm. they did a really good job about that, and that just goes back into what I said about like the difficulty balancing and them really knowing what you would need in that situation. Um, I always felt like it was worth it, which I think is really important coming off of a game like um, Final Fantasy II, especially. I'm going to keep bashing that game <laughs> in its exploration. <laughs> I just Ouch. recently watched my like full playthrough of that game. And how much I was getting upset at it, too. It was so funny. It was you played, very funny. And you played the Pixel remaster, didn't you? I played the Pixel remaster. So, so yep. you, you had the easy version, the easiest version, yeah. the most charitable the easiest. version. Yeah, it, also, it was also not the patched version, though, so oh. enemies were still able to kill you through like instant death, even if you had ribbons and everything else, which was lovely. Awful. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Broken game. Broken. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, NPCs is another thing I want to talk about because, wow, I actually think they did a really good job with this. I felt like talking to the NPCs, not only did they teach you some mechanics and stuff that you wouldn't know, but also <clears throat> they add so much to the story in the towns. Like, what is it? Mesidia? Yeah. That's, that's the big one, right? Yeah. You go to Mesidia and the, yeah, the magic town. Um, <laughs> that was a a really cool moment for me because I think people take it for granted now, but speaking to all the NPCs and it not just being like, oh, you want to do this, you got to do this, like Final Fantasy 1 is, to an extent. They do a decent job in the early NES ones. Um, But for it to tell a story and for them to not be very happy with you for essentially ruining their lives was really cool one of the the dancer turns you into a pig yeah uh if you go to the bar they try to kill you like Mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff like one one person runs away from you um i don't know i found that to be really important and also really important from a storytelling perspective because that's right after cecil like ends up washed up on the beach Um, yeah so he has no one he's at his lowest point at that moment yeah He's at his lowest point, and the one thing he has to turn to is what he did. And a big theme of this game is like atonement um, w- through through Cecil, um, and actually a lot of the other characters too, from what I played. So, <clears throat> you know, having to see your path forward to being to atonement, being through the very town that you ru- in these people's lives that you ruined, was actually really really smart, in my opinion. I, I really liked that they did that. Um, so that's one really good um, example of of great NPC design. Do you guys can you think of any off the top of your heads? Honestly, I think Mesidia is kind of the peak of that because pretty much all of the others that I can think of are more or less just like a bit of flavor. Like uh, what was it, Troya, which is uh, a kingdom that's like ruled by women, like just before the Dark oh. Elf. Yeah, it's just like, okay, that's yeah. that's some neat flavor. And then there's like mm-hmm. the dwarves, which, you know, they're, you know. Lolly ho. I was just, I, that's all I have written down is lolly ho. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like the, the, nice. the dwarves are fun, but there's not, there's not much there other than they're fun. And they've known yeah. about the dark crystals. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. The, the, yeah. Like the, the NPCs, they're not bad. The world feels like something that is alive but like most most of the people you meet don't feel like they existed before the start of the game like they they the npcs are like yeah. you mean the party members no the npcs party the party okay. member the party members are definitely more fleshed out but the npcs mm-hmm. most of them feel they feel like they ex- only existed when you booted up the cart Mm-hmm. That's fair. I can I can <clears throat> definitely see that. A yeah. lot of them are there to tell you where to go next. Pretty yeah, much. Which, which is just how RPGs kind of are. Yeah. Uh but at the same at the same time, you know, thank but but at the same time, while the NPCs aren't for the most part aren't that great, the spaces that they inhabit are far more intriguing. Like mm-hmm. as- aesthetically you Aesthetically, you get an idea of what each of these places is all about culturally, which I find to be fascinating. Like, Mesidia, you know, it's a town of myths and legends. 
uh, Fabul. They are more of a traditional, you know, honor bound, uh, honor bound nation. Yeah, they really like training. Exactly. Too. Yeah, couldn't be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, a, that's so, true. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of there's a lot of pros and cons to it. It's it, it works overall, but uh, definitely could have been better yeah um, i i it definitely could have and i'm i'm sure it obviously it does later in the series and in other jrpgs and stuff but i think you can i think you can see like a little bit of an evolution um from the previous games to this one i can't i can't think of an example where something like that stood out to me in in uh in like three two uh, two i think was pretty decent about it um but that's just because the overall theme was that everything was like sad and dying and getting bombed and so everyone was just constantly depressed um but in here i, I think it was it was also used really well um like effectively in storytelling uh so now we're going to be tackling the story of final fantasy 4 starting off just the general story beat by beat and how we feel about it and um Andrew is going to lead us on that topic. So Final Fantasy IV is the most story driven game of the series so far. We open up on a effectively a, a cutscene is what we would call it today of the the airship fleet of the Kingdom of Baron, the Red Wings, uh, returning home after a mission to successfully steal a crystal from the village of Mesidia. The, lead, the captain of the Red Wings, Cecil Harvey, is clearly distraught over his actions there. He's uncomfortable with the orders that their king has been giving them to procure these crystals for purposes unknown. And when he voices these concerns, the king strips him of his rank uh, for speaking out of turn. Mm -hmm. but but Cecil is given a chance to redeem himself in the eyes of King Baron by taking a special ring to the nearby uh, to the nearby Mist Village it's it, I can't remember the actual name is it <clears throat> Mist Village it's not Mist Village I think it? it's just I think it is it's yep, the Mist village I could of, be wrong Village of Mist in the Mist Valley uh, yeah. The only thing that has stopped the king from sending other forces to do that is the Eidolon, the mist dragon, in the nearby caves. Cecil is accompanied by his longtime comrade and best friend, basically his brother, uh, the dragoon Kane, uh, the dragoon Kane Highwind, uh, both of whom were raised uh, from children by the king of Baron. And both have reservations about the king's strange and hostile disposition as of late. Mm -hmm. They slay the Eidolon, they bring the ring to mist, and the ring was a booby trap. It, it is holding a bunch of bombs, bomb enemies, that explode and burn the village of mist to the ground. The only survivor is a young girl named Rydia, who has who before just lost her mother because her I'm pausing a lot I apologize okay. uh, it's okay because her <clears throat> mother recently died just out of the blue her dragon her idolin the mist dragon was slain their life forces were linked once it was slain she too passed yeah Se so Mm -hmm. Oh, do you, okay. So you want to finish up the points on yeah. Mist, and then we'll talk about it. Yeah, okay. Get through, yeah, get through <clears throat> the inciting incident. Mm -hmm. the, why? As for why the king wanted the village of Mist to be raised, well, this is the last vestiges of the of uh, of the summoners, uh, spe special magical peoples who are able to call forth powerful beings known as Idolins, like that Mist Dragon. And basically, you know, they're, 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 they're very powerful. They were a threat to his power, even though they weren't really doing anything. This 10-year-old yeah. child, Rydia, is now the only surviving summoner. 
and she summons Titan to tear the Earth asunder and sep <laughs> causing Cecil and Cain to become separated. Cecil, when Cecil awakens, he is with a passed out Rydia, and he vows not only to get to the child to safety for what he's done to her village, but also to fight against his kingdom and his king for the horrible acts that he's had to commit in their honor. He plans to gather allies to do so, and the first ally that he plans to recruit is his lover, Rosa, who is still at the castle. Yeah. Great. Okay, so <clears throat> I feel like that this is a very, very strong opening to the story of this game. Absolutely. This entire setup. Um, you start, uh, exactly like you said, on the way back, and, and Cecil is kind of questioning, or sorry, it's actually his men, I believe, that are questioning yes. him on the king's actions, right? And he has to be like, don't worry about it, essentially. Yeah, but internally, he's... he's there. Internally, yeah. he's yeah, he's messed up. He doesn't want to be doing any of this. And seeing that that er, that inner tur turmoil is actually really really important to the character. <clears throat> uh, and then when you get back, I think you have a really really important conversation with Rosa. Is that where this happens? Uh, it is. You briefly see her, I think. No, she's brought up, I believe, before you speak to the king. If you talk to certain people. Um, it is after uh, your Cecil is given the ring by yeah. the king, and the night before they actually go out, that she comes to visit him in his uh, in his room in his tower, and he's brooding. Yeah, this is. I thought that this was really good. Uh, even the cutscene in two D. I've seen the cutscene in three D too with the voice acting and stuff, which I think is even better. It is really good. Um, mm hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Also, the theme of love, I believe it's called. Uh, yeah, Rose's or, theme is it? great. There's there's a special version that was composed to advertise the 3D version, uh, which I, I I especially love that version. The instrumental to that is absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. That that's the one with the vocals too, though, right? Yeah, there. Yeah, it's a vocal track, but they released an instrumental <laughs> alongside it. Okay. Yeah, I love that theme. That's the one that played at the end of the credits for you, Fred. Oh, okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> that conversation of like Rosa still seeing the good in Cecil and knowing that he doesn't want to do this, and Cecil like feeling like he's undeserving yes. of essentially what's going on is really really good. Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to bring that up. Also, when I played, it was literally called the Bomb Ring. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think it was, it was the same in the three D. Yeah, at somewhere along the way, they they just dropped the pretense and called it a bomb ring. Whereas, like, I yeah. think I think in the Naming Way edition, which is the one I played, they called it the Signet Ring. Okay, but that seems a lot better because, like, especially as the, I mean, obviously, like as the player, I feel like you would want to feel a little bit more connected with the situation with Cecil, right? You don't want to know that it's actually a bomb ring. You, like, exactly, you would want to. Or you could you say, man, this a is mystery. a bomb ring, yo. <laughs> yes, it's a bomb ring. Uh, oh, no, it's not a bomb but... ring. It's a bomb ring. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Ce Cecil's on the uh, no-fly list. <laughs> yeah, For geez. real. Um, so, yeah, and then the thing with Rydia being so, like, the fact that you are directly responsible <laughs> for her mother passing... And then her essentially like having to face that trauma as you're trying to like chase her down to apologize. Um, and her summoning Titan. I think she's seven, actually. I don't know if she is she 10 or seven. I'm reasonably certain she's 10. Okay. Uh, either way, way too young for any of this. That's yeah, so exactly. traumatic. To really oh, man. You want, you want, you want <laughs> yeah. to know something more fucked up? In uh, one of the uh, like sort of info guides that was released in Japan. Uh, there's background that's uh, revealed that uh, not only is Mist Village the last like vestiges of the summoners, the summoners have been dying out for generations uh, because partially because of generations of inbreeding. Oh, yeah. Obviously, weird. obviously, it doesn't come up in the game, so like, <laughs> yeah, you no. Know, it, does it really matter? <laughs> not really, but it's yeah it's one of those things there's a lot of interesting information in that guidebook i, I bring it up <laughs> i bring some of it up in my video but uh 
you know, mm -hmm. I, I kind of brush it aside partially there, too. It's like, this is interesting, but irrelevant. Mm. Yeah. But it's just one of those, another thing that, like, kind of takes inspiration probably from back in the day when you had a lot of these empires who would do inbreeding in order to keep their bloodline, like, pure, you yeah. know, whatever, pure and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, maybe, in, maybe in this case, in the backstory, it was if you didn't then maybe you wouldn't be able to be a summoner or something i, I mean, don't like the summoner's you know, abilities <clears throat> again according to this book uh grew weaker over time as a result of the inbreeding so, oh as a result of it okay that's just strange yeah, then i don't yeah but again uh. again it's one of those things it doesn't come up in the story i doubt it's in the after years oh well yeah <laughs> uh yeah but overall really really strong opener yeah, it is. And from there, we start to gather allies gradually. Cecil makes his way to Kaipo with uh, an unconscious Rydia in tow. Or in hand, rather. He's not, like, dragging her. Or at least I hope not. Yeah. He's a dark knight <laughs> at this point, but that doesn't make him evil. Yeah. He brings her to the inn at Kaipo. Stays, stays by her side to make sure she's okay. She won't say a word to him. He apologizes and tries to get through to her. It doesn't work. They stay the night. Some soldiers from Baron come by and they try to kill her because she's the last summoner. Cecil protects her, after which Rydia begins to open up to him, tells him her name, and understands this guy may have destroyed my village, but clearly it was not intentional. Mm. Yeah. The next morning they find that Rosa has actually left the castle and made her way all the way to Kaipo in the middle of the desert, but has come down with a case of desert fever. And the only cure is the Pearl of an Antlion. Along the mm -hmm. way, Cecil and Rydia, they come across a couple allies. They find the old sage Tella, who has forgotten most of his magic and is now quite irate at a bard who has seemingly stolen away his daughter, to be the spoony one. The, the, the spooniest of bards. Uh, yes. And when you find this bard named Edward, turns out he is the Prince of Damzian, uh, which is uh, prompt, which just before meeting him is bombed by the Red Wings and their fire crystals stolen. Tella leaves the party. Edward comes with us. Well, also Tella's daughter, who eloped, who got, who uh, ran away with Edward because they were in love. Uh, she died in the assault, and Edward is racked with guilt. Yeah. <clears throat> we go fight the ant lion. Uh, we cure Rose's desert fever, and then we make our way to uh, Mount Fabul. Was it Mount Fabul? I know it's the mountain on the way to Fabul. I, I don't know the name. the name of the mountain, but yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, but I know what you're talking about. On the way to yeah. Fabul. Which, which is where we get a nice character beat for Rydia. There is a, a lot of ice blocking the path up the mountain. And the only way through is by melting it. Rydia is a black mage of, well, she can use, she can use black magic. And one of the most basic black magic spells is fire. But Rydia refuses to. But Rydia refuses to cast it. She doesn't. She doesn't have it in her spell list. But she apparently does know how to do it. But yeah. the trauma of seeing her village burn down has led to her refuse. Led to her refusal to want to cast fire. Understandable. Yeah, honestly, that's another one of those, like, gameplay to story things that I feel like the game does really, really well. Um, and it's completely understandable. I actually don't like how it's handled completely, though, because it almost feels like they're just trying to brush the trauma aside and, like, really almost peer pressure her, in, yeah. her into doing it instead of, like, being compassionate in a conversation yeah. about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's kind of just like, just do it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's in a weird state where... You know, you want to understand it's like, okay, we got to move things along. But on the other hand, yeah. it's like we have to actually like address this. And it's like, okay, well, if we try and find another way around it, that just feels like padding. Yeah. 
another another quick thing that I thought was kind of weird about the I guess the tone um, was Edward had just lost like everything and then, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then Rydia comes up like don't cry and then Cecil like slaps him or something yeah. like that Rydia and Cecil <laughs> are like what get it heck? together I know you lost everything but we're fighting a war yeah. <laughs> Like, I don't know, I figured there'd be a little bit more compassion with the, t you know, two people he would have a, something to, to grip on, like some, some something to relate <laughs> over, but nah, just a slap in the face. I just need it's the crystals. Nobody likes yeah, Edward. That. Yep, even the developers don't like Edward, assumably. I like Edward. <laughs> I like the dude. I think he's a good guy. He's, he's an okay <laughs> dude, but he sucks in battle. <laughs> Yeah, he's not. Fair he's point. not great in battle. Yeah. Thank thankfully, he's not around for long. Mm. Up on yeah, the mountain, he's... we f up on the mountain we meet the monk uh, Yang, uh, who is red who is ready to offer his assistance in uh, against Baron, especially considering that uh, his kingdom Fabul uh, holds one of the crystals. Uh, we get back to the uh, to the palace of Fabul. We try to fend off the forces of Baron. And are unsuccessful as, well, Barrett's forces are led by Cain. Well, yeah. well, in this instance, they're led by Cain, who handily beats Cecil's ass. It Easily. seems that he, it seems that uh, whatever pro the promise that he and Cecil made to fight against Baron, uh, he didn't intend on keeping it. In actuality, he's just being. Uh, he's basically just being mind controlled, but you don't find that out till later. Shortly after this, well, actually, right after this, it's uh, you're given a boat to go back to Baron, but on the way, Leviathan the Sea Beast swallows up the ship, separates Cecil from his party, yeah. and he <clears throat> winds up on the shores of Mysidia, the very place where this whole story technically began. He stole their crystal. Some people died, and they all know it was him, and they're ready to let him have it. Yeah. Um, as far as this part goes, I think there's something to be said also that we don't know what happened to any of our party, except for us, once that, that ship wrecks, right? Or the ship gets uh, in, in, yeah. down. In, in the moment, <clears throat> yeah, we don't know. All we know is that when Rydia fell into the ocean, Yong dived in after her. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then we already kind of talked about this part and how important it is. Yeah. So, right, with the atonement especially. Yeah. yeah, Cecil approaches the Elder and seeks to find some way to atone for his wrongdoing. And the Elder's like, mm -hmm. you know what? I see some spark of light in you, lad of darkness. But uh, you keep using this dark blade. Uh, your heart's going to be tinged by that darkness. So you got a paladin up, bucko. Yeah. So it's like... Win all Kingdom Hearts on him. More or less. I like Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> I know you do. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, so it's like, oh, go over to Mount Ordeals and Christ up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here, here are these two twins, these magical prodigies, Palam and Porum. One of them's annoying, one of them less so. Also, uh, you're going to find an old man up there. We like him. And you should, too. I don't like yes. Tella. Really? You don't like Tella? I character. thought Tella was cool. I don't think he's a bad... I don't think he's a bad character. He's just one of... He's probably just my least favorite character of the bunch. He's uninteresting. Like, I don't... I don't dislike him as a character. I think that um, I wouldn't be his friend... Right. He seems like a not friendly person. Yeah. Grumpy. <laughs> if that like, makes sense. I, I I said it like in my video, like as an aside, and apparently people like took offense to it or didn't understand what I was saying. I, I said he has big racist grandpa energy. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's funny. Not that he not that I think Tell is a racist. I, he just has that vibe. <laughs> yeah. The vibe yeah. of that one relative at Thanksgiving you don't want to talk to. Oh, Uncle Steve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's good. Uncle Tell. Yeah, he's got to learn a thing or two. Um, <clears throat> Grandpa, yeah. segregation is over. 
Jeez. White magic and black um, magic share a bathroom now. Oh my gosh. So anyway, t- uh, tell, yeah. Yeah, tell us up there because he's trying to relearn some magic. He's per- in particular trying to find the ultra powerful spell Meteor or Medio, depending on the version you're playing, because he learned that the new leader of the Red Wings, a man named Galbez, uh, it was it is it exists, and because the Red Wings were the ones that bombed Damsian and uh, basically killed his daughter, uh, he wants to seek revenge. And he figures, you know what, Meteor's gonna be some big ol' revenge. Gonna throw a big cosmic rock at him. Was it the encounter with Kane that we also meet Golbez though? I th- in the crystal room. I think so, but Tella was not present for that. Okay, right. I just <clears throat> I wanted to make sure we don't gloss over it because that was the introduction to Golbez as a villain right. where he actually shows up. And I think you actually kind of maybe get a hint that Kane is being mind controlled. Um, maybe not completely. You don't get the full yes, picture. Yes, you do get a But Golbez is, yeah, yeah well, is issuing orders yeah. to him. And Kane like freaks out, well, like yeah. grips his head when he sees Rosa. Yeah, when he uh-huh. sees Rosa, he is overcome with shame saying like, don't look at me. And stops yeah. trying to kill Cecil. Uh, yeah, Gobez just comes in and just like smacks everyone, smacks everyone asunder, and says, and then captures Rosa. It's like I don't, whatever. I didn't come here to to mess around with you guys. I came here for the crystal, right? Essentially, yeah. So at the at, <clears throat> so at the top of Mount Ordeals, after defeating one of the four fiends that Gobez has enlisted to hamper Cecil's progress. There is a chamber uh, where Cecil hears a voice referring to him as it as a uh, as his son. Cecil takes a myth graven blade on which there is a myth engraven into the blade, uh, and he has Indeed. to face a physical <laughs> manifestation of his inner darkness. And the only way to defeat it is to turn the other cheek. Yeah. A true, Do nothing. A true paladin would sheath his blade. A, tr- a paladin <laughs> does not seek conflict, but rather tries to prevent conflict, to protect others rather than lash out. Yeah. And this this is definitely one of the highlights of the game's storytelling. Because it marries gameplay, narrative, and the- theme and character. It is the culmin it is the true turning point for Cecil where you know mm-hmm. where you know his <clears throat> his intentions haven't changed but his out but uh, now he's given perspective you know but right just because now he's become a paladin doesn't mean his journey is done he still has a long way to go to atone but he, he's always been a good person it's this that's really taking that first step to, to that atonement I feel exactly. As for who mm-hmm. that voice was, the voice that imbued Cecil with the power of light, uh, it's not clear yet what that voice was, but it, it will in time. As for the myth engraven on the blade, it is the Mycidian legend, uh, basic, which uh, we'll wrap back around to in due course. From here, a lot of a lot of its minutia. From here, rec- uh, Finding party members again, going back to Baron, finding out that the king was not the king, but one of the four fiends in disguise. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, rescuing Rosa, making sure other people were okay. Uh, Tella giving his life to stop Galbez, but all it really does is slow him down. Learning that Galbez was able to control Kane by honing in on his jealousy for Cecil because, well, Kane also harbored feelings for Rosa, but Rosa right. instead, you know, fell in love with Cecil, and that jealousy festered, and Golbez used that to control him. Mm-hmm. And he breaks free of that until, well, it turns out that he didn't break free of it. Golbez just loosened his grip to make it easier for him for uh for Cecil to uh, gather the rest of the crystals, specifically. Yeah, the dark that actually uh, surprised me. Yeah, it was, that it was one a, surprised me. Yeah, it was a nice twist, but it also led to a lot of people saying, "Oh, Kane is just a chronic backstabber." 
Yeah, totally. Yeah. I feel like it was deeper than just him backstabbing to backstab, though. Yeah, yeah, it was deeper. Yeah. Absolutely what it was. You know, he it wasn't his will. Mm-hmm. It was but the control. One, but once Galbez gets a hold of all of the four light crystals of the overworld and the dark crystals of the underworld, he he is able to activate the Tower of Babel. But all, but by activating yep. the Tower of Babel, something else was able to be risen from beneath the waves near Mesidia as part of the Mesidian legend. The Lunar Whale, a vehicle that allows you to travel <laughs> to the moon <coughs> yeah where we learn that stuff. one of these two moons is an artificial moon that was created by a, by a by a race called the lunarians that lost their planet some eons ago and they found they found earth but they saw that life was beginning to form here and thought well there's already life here, but it's very primitive. We'll wait until they are sufficiently advanced enough that we can coexist, and so put themselves into deep hibernation. All except for one, Usoya, who would oversee the, lunar, uh, the Lunarian slumber and keep them safe. But there were others who had other plans. The first being Kluya, who became fascinated by Earth, built the lunar whale, and came down to, you know, just see the sights, mingle with the Earthlings, and had two children with a woman yeah. named Cecilia. The first of them right. was um, was uh, the first of them was a boy named Theodore, and the second was Cecil. Yeah. However, there was another Lunarian named Zemus who was not down with the let's wait so we can coexist plan, but was totally up for raising the world so that we can take it for our own. And despite being locked away, his malice continued to seep out and influence other people down below, particularly Galbez. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I I wish that the Lunarian plot point. I mean, I wish that I felt it a little bit closer to home because it it just feels like to me that it wasn't properly foreshadowed, uh, other than like Cecil's father calling out to him. I don't I don't know if I like mixed a uh, missed some context but it just feels like it comes out of nowhere to me when i played the game there is one um, there is a bit of fo uh, light foreshadowing that's completely lost outside of japan and that is uh through naming way the little rabbit that you see in like all the inns and such throughout the game yeah there is a japanese folk tale of uh the rabbit on the moon rabbit on the moon okay yeah that yeah. Uh, basically <clears throat> explains why the patterns on the moon surface look like a, a rabbit pounding mochi uh, yeah. and so naming way being a rabbit was kind of meant to be like another bit of light foreshadowing and there's a little bit more foreshadowing you can see the, the telescope to look at the moon yeah exactly uh that was supposed to be yeah. a clue that like hey something funky's going on with the moon here mm -hmm. uh yeah when i was playing i knew that there was something going to happen with the moon because of the that kind of stuff that i was encountering especially with the telescope right cuz they wouldn't show me that stuff unless there was but i guess like the big plot points around it like lunarians existing and this being a huge like zemis like these characters came out of like nowhere to me because it was like okay we're having like three layers of mind control here we have zemis over golbez over kane exactly and, like it, i was just like what what's going on <laughs> yeah it it feels it feels like a lot i think the 3d version does a bit of a better job simply because of being able to use a 3d camera in uh in cutscenes so that you can have the moon in certain shots uh so that you can actually telegraph it better yeah 
But once you get over the hump, then everything else just starts landing mm -hmm. really hard because uh, the Tower of Babel, a great machine that in the 3D version specifically, it's context it's uh, explained that uh, the Tower of Babel was a creation of the Lunarians, specifically like Zemus's cult of uh, of extremists, to basically like destroy everything on the planet to get ready for colonization. And after destroying the tower, the the giant of Babel's uh, CPU, Fusoya breaks Zemus's hold on Golbez, and that's when we learn that Golbez's real name is Theodore, and that he and Cecil yeah. are brothers. Mm, now, in the, yeah. in the 3D version, this leads to <clears throat> an to an extra sequence where we actually get to see. Uh, Theodore's childhood like from yep. like uh, leading up oh. to like like so like we get to meet uh, their father Cluya we get to meet their mother Cecilia and uh, we see the village that they lived in and Cluya taught the people of the world magic but then there were some people who took this gift and used it to use it against Cluya they killed him uh, you know, just some bad people out there in the world. And so Cecilia was going through a difficult pregnancy with Cecil. And she died in childbirth. So now it was just Theodore and his baby brother. And there was a bit of resentment towards Cecil. Because even though he knew intellectually that, you know, Cecil did not kill his mother. It was just unfortunate circumstance. Mm -hmm. Seamus started exerting his will over Theodore and amplifying oh, okay. that resentment. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't this in the Pixel Remaster at all? I mean, I get that it's trying to retain the, the original. original experience, I guess, but damn, that really does enhance the story, I feel. Yeah, they, they, didn't, they didn't even have it in the PSP version either, which came out after the 3D version. Uh, mm. Because the PSP version is like more just, of the, more just a riff on the GBA version, which came out before... Right, okay. So Golbez, now racked with guilt over things that he did that were not of his own will, decides to join Fusoya uh, in returning to the moon to defeat Zemus once and for all. And Cecil is completely beside himself. He has barely spoken a word since the reveal of his parentage. Yeah. And everyone around him is trying to coax him into saying something, like, to actually, like, process what's going on, acknowledge what's going on, say something to his brother, and he's just out of it. It's, it is a lot for him to take in. And this keeps going right up until the very end, where Golbez and Fusoya seemingly defeat Zemus, but his malice manifests into this eldritch abomination Zeromus. And through the power of friendship, Cecil and the rest of the party are able to defeat Zeromus. And Theodore decides, I would like to meet my father and his people. I would like to go to sleep with the rest of them. And he gives a heartfelt farewell to his little brother, not expecting forgiveness before going into hibern before stepping down further into the uh, moon's core to hibernate mm -hmm. Cecil's friends including Kane all like egg him on to say something anything and he finally steps forward and acknowledges Theodore as his brother yeah mm -hmm. to which Theodore thanks him before going to join their people. Mm -hmm. Which is really important to the main themes of the game. Atonement and forgiveness. Uh, at least atonement and forgiveness, yeah. Um, you know, you have to be able to forgive and understand other people as well if you are going to forgive yourself, uh, I feel. Um, <clears throat> but definitely, yeah, That the way that you put it there kind of made me rethink it a little bit there especially with that that other scene 
that I had never known about yeah. in the 3D yeah. version. Yeah, and it's also important to note that when it's revealed that Galbez was his brother, Cecil does think about, you know, if he had continued down the path that he was going down, would would he have ended up like Galbez? Could their roles have been reversed somewhere? Yes, yeah. and it's that, like, um, light versus darkness or whatever, where, again, that darkness within you is going to be easily controlled by, uh, you know, Zem uh, Zeramis or or whatever. Um, so it's it's totally possible that he could have been the one who was mind controlled. Exactly. Cecil is a very strong character. Mm -hmm. I th I think that a lot of people really do not give credit where credits due, especially considering Takashi Takeda when he came on to produce Final Fantasy IV. He had it in mind to have the game's presentation reflect that of a feature film like he, he approached presentation from the expect from the perspective of a film editor and yep. while <clears throat> obviously you can't really go full force with that with uh with a super nintendo the effort clearly shows yeah i think now when i think about it when did this game come out Nin actually the original 1991 1991. Wow. Yes. I can't think of anything that was coming out at the time that would have a character like this, a character arc that's so, like, in-depth. Like, I, I don't... Like, in a, on a Super Nintendo game. Yeah. Right? Like... And while it wasn't I, the first RPG <clears throat> on the Super Famicom, it was yep. the first original RPG on the Super Famicom that wasn't a port of something else. Yeah. So... I'm not going to make a definitive statement and say, you know, this was like the first ever RPG that had a character that was this deep, but uh, it might have been, you know? I think Dragon Quest IV may have beat it to the punch on that, but I haven't played it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's, def it's definitely one of those, one of the, more of one of those turning points in the genre for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I could only imagine, like, if I played this at the time, how I would have felt about it, you know? Because now I, I play plenty of video games, and I, I try not to take the storytelling in these older games for granted, Ex right? Yeah, exactly. And that's, why, and that's why I play them, to see how it all evolves, but... Um, <clears throat> I don't have the perspective as a kid who was growing up in 1991... And he got to play this as one of the first JRPGs with a character this strong. Exactly. You know. And the thing is, too, is that, you know, there was plenty I skipped over. Like, I didn't even talk about Edge. And, yeah, you know, how, true. you know, he comes off, like, <clears throat> as sort of a cocky prince that, like, you know, it's like, oh, well, I'm, I'm the coolest. And then... Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, Sonic the Hedgehog, <laughs> like, a month after Sonic the Hedgehog came out. Um, yeah, but then we go up the Tower of Babel for the first time, and we learn what happened to his parents. They were, you know, they weren't killed; they were taken prisoner by uh, one of Galbez's, well, technically Rubicante's henchmen, uh, Doctor Lugai, who performed horrific yeah. experiments on them and turned them into chimeric monsters. Who... Yeah, that was a really creepy part of the game, and honestly, I watched I watched Fred play that part of the game, like the, the cutscene that plays after. The voice acting there was actually really, really well done, yeah. too. There was a lot of emotion in Edge's screams there, and it was actually a pretty sad scene. It was well done. Yeah. Um, and speaking, uh, of, speaking of voice acting, Galbez's voice actor in the scene after, uh, like, we play through, like, his backstory... Just like him, just like they're, they're, like it's clear that what he's done weighs so heavy on him that he's just mm -hmm. so racked with guilt, and he's just got this resolve not just to fight against what had been manipulating him for so long, but that he has no intentions of surviving whatever comes next. That if he, yeah. if he dies, so be it. I've done enough horrible shit that I do not deserve to continue going on in this world. Mm -hmm. 
Like like Fred, you obviously you've played the the three yeah. version, so you saw that scene. How how were you? The how you ultimate sacrifice. He wanted to make the ultimate sacrifice to save the world, or at least help save the world. It felt like. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> it just it, like and the fact and the like the Darth Vader influence in Galbez, like his character design and such, is very apparent. The voice actor they got for him in the that. English version, like, is. Like they they is very Darth Vader. Like he's got this deep. Yeah, it's like very yeah. like oh da, 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 da. It's it's almost like single tonal as well. Yeah, uh, for a lot of it. And having that voice express such profound sorrow is without like devolving into a blubbering mess is always moving to me. It's why mm -hmm. I love uh, Vader at the end of Return of the Jedi because you know that he is. That he's he doesn't have much time left. He's done some bad shit. He just wants one small gesture. He just wants one small gesture of humanity, and he's good to go. Like and a purpose. Get, yeah, well, in the case of Vader, it was, you know, let me take this mask off, let me look at you with my own eyes. With Golbez, it's I've done wrong. Let me make it right. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's very, you know, definitive in that res very strong resolve. Right. Very strong resolve. <clears throat> um, okay. And then I guess it would just be the the epilogue, right? And then I guess we'll go into any of our thoughts or feelings on some of those moments that we talked about. The epilogue was one of the sweetest moments in the story, I feel. Especially watching the cutscene in 3D. My favorite, my favorite um, part. Seeing the the wedding between Cecil and and Rosa, mm -hmm. and seeing all the characters come back and stuff, it was super nice. It, um, it, it was it was a happy ending that they deserved, and even then, it's still bittersweet in a sense because you know the uh, the red moon goes off into the cosmos. Uh, it's implied that uh, Theodore sent a telepathic message to Cecil saying goodbye. Cain mm -hmm. has not returned to Baron. He is out he is up on mount ordeals he wants to bolster his resolve to you know be the best version of himself that he can be so he can never be taken advantage of again uh you know young has become the king of fabul edge is edge and edward are rebuilding their kingdoms yeah you know it and ridia well, Rydia is just hanging out down in the uh, <laughs> down in the the realm of the Idolans. The, yeah, the realm. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is where Leviathan took her, uh, because mm -hmm. Leviathan is not just an Idolan, but the king of Idolans, and uh, figured that she was in danger. So that's why he uh, t broke the ship and took her away from everyone else to protect her, which led to some time dilation. So when she comes back. Uh, around the midpoint of the story, she is a uh, she is a fully grown woman. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. Rydia is actually one of my favorite characters in this game too. Same. Just seeing her return, it was it was such a, a great moment in the story. Yeah, I really really yeah. enjoyed that. But, and just I just think her personality is super cute. Yeah, uh, and the way she interacts with the other characters. Yeah, but the the fact that <clears throat> you know I've had to go back and well we've had to go back and bring up things that have been glossed over tells you that uh that there's a lot of uh, little things in this story that are almost ancillary to the core uh story of cecil yeah uh, and that it doesn't bring the game down but it does tell you that these games are getting more multifaceted they're getting more complicated at this point yep totally um, <clears throat> in another way, well, not just Kane becoming a, a the best version of himself, but obviously that also goes into the themes of atonement, right? Right. And forgiving yourself. And he's doing it on Mount Ordeals. I think he wants to also maybe become a paladin or something else or, you know, just not use the power of darkness in the same way. Um, another big theme at the end of the game that, that they talk about, well, actually, I'll save this one for the very end i want to go into our favorite moments and stuff first one moment that was glossed over 
um, ha- actually had to do with Edward, and it was during that dark elf oh, fight, right. I believe. Yeah, with the whisper. Yeah. Weed. Mm-hmm. During his travels as a musician, you know, he never really, to my knowledge, said that he was a, you know, prince or whatever. He was just kind of following his own passions. Yeah. And um, happened to learn a song that is not very nice to elves or, uh, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> just some, something in myth that he learned. And it just shows that even though he wasn't very strong in battle, that he was still a very useful person. And he got that way by following his own passions. And he was still able, in spite of his like lack of courageousness and um, battle prowess, be helpful to everyone. And I really liked that moment because not everyone is going to be super helpful on the battlefield or in the direct line of fire, but with their own skills uh, that they've gathered throughout their lives, um, it still shows that in spite of all of that, he didn't have like a huge personality change or anything. He just tried his best and it helped. And I really like that. And I guess maybe as a musician myself, um, as someone who tries to like change the lives of others through my own work or my music and stuff like that. That that was something that meant a lot to me personally. I, I liked that moment. It was cool. <clears throat> right. And there are a lot of really solid moments of showing who these characters are uh, outside of battle. You know, like a young diving into the ocean to save Ridia or staying behind to uh, destroy the cannons in the Tower of Babel. And yeah. while, it, while it feels like everyone gets a chance to sacrifice themselves and it's revealed, hey, I'm okay, uh, except for Tella, a commenter on my video brought up that it's, you know, kind of a, uh, it's kind of a thematic point where uh, the nature of their sacrifice kind of reflects whether or not they'll come back. You know, if it's a selfless sacrifice, their reward is to continue living, whereas if it's a selfish sacrifice, well, that's it. You're done. Game over. Bye, Tella. Yeah, that's true. Actually, I didn't think about that. There are also so many fake... Well, it uh, it feels like it goes overboard yeah, with it, like, it, the fake deaths it, to it me. It definitely does. It feels like they couldn't really write an organic way for people to cycle in and out of the party, so they went with the sacrifice, but it's like, oh, we don't want this to be too dark, but... I mean, that they would change that tune soon enough. They also kind of made fun of it with Sid at the point where, like... Because it happened so much up until that point. Remember that that time he was in bed and he was just, like, overworked? Yeah. And it happened, like, twice. And then it's just, like, it's silent and then it's him sleeping or something. Yeah. I'm like... I actually thought he died. <laughs> and I was like, no, they're just making fun of themselves at this point with the fake deaths. Yeah, I could feel like that. Um, right, hold on. Um, yeah. Keep recording. I really need to use the bathroom. I will be right back. Okay. Sure. I'll use the bathroom as well. <laughs> okay. Perfect. <laughs> <clears throat>
Sorry about that. I would have gone during the break, but uh, it was occupied. Oh, that's okay. <clears throat> if you ever need more time on a break in the future, just let me know. Hey, you're good. Sorry, um, Sammy, You're because we, I'm not in like a room or anything. I, I just had Sammy order food. Oh, or okay. I'm using the wrong headphones. <laughs> yeah, Sammy, <laughs> Sammy's ordering food, so. All right. All right, cool. let's get back to it. <clears throat> what are we talking about, Final Fantasy or something? Oh uh, um, no, I think it's, um, Golbez. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we were just talking about uh, the characters dying and coming back. Oh, right, yeah, right, right. Yeah, like you left off on uh, on Sid and uh, how you felt like he had actually died after overworking himself. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was actually kind of funny after they, they were... Essentially, to me, it seemed like they were making fun of themselves because it was just like going to sleep after. It was like, few Because it happened like twice. I think mm -hmm. Sid had the most fake deaths he did. Out, of, out of any of them. Okay. Sid or Yon. Uh, but... Yeah, true. true. Yeah, uh, Friedrich, because I haven't heard much from you on this entire story segment. Yeah, I want you to talk about your feelings on the story, your favorite moments, how okay. you felt going through it. Well, um, so should I guess we don't have to clap because we weren't. Um, we never stopped. Yeah, yeah we didn't stop so. recording. That's no. fine. <clears throat> Um, okay, so you can. So go for on. my favorite parts of this game, I definitely thought uh, I, I have a pretty basic opinions. I feel like my favorite overall thing that happened was the wedding at the end, and I feel like that's most people that played the 3D version's favorite part. Uh, it's very charming. It's cool to see all the characters back together. I really liked the redemption arc of. Cecil finally becoming a paladin and then atoning for his sins by, you know, fighting the powers of darkness. And I thought, yeah, I, I thought, um, Rydia was very charming. I really liked Rosa, uh, Palom and, uh, Palom and, how do you say it? Palom and Porum. Palom and Porum. Those two were my two favorite um, characters. I thought they were very really? charming. Yeah, I really, I really like, liked them. Most people find them to be really annoying. <laughs> I mean, they were kind of OP, to be honest. So maybe oh, that's yeah. why, why I like them so much. I, I thought they were very good. Um, Cecil, obviously, was awesome. The... Um, what was it like the four elemental people the fiends. that he, the fiends yeah uh i thought those are really cool aspects to the game i liked those fights for the most part until you had to fight them all four at the same time i thought that was <laughs> terrible i i had a hard time with that as well um yeah i remember <clears throat> i <laughs> i don't know i'm glad it's over at this point <laughs> yeah, only because you played uh, the 3D version. Yeah, I I do regret it a little bit, but after I started it, I didn't want to finish. I I didn't want to finish the other version. Mm hmm. Um. Yeah, Rubicante was actually one of my. I I really liked Rubicante. Really? I don't I don't know what it was. I yeah, it's just him like being one most. of the fiends, but he has a good side. He was like, "I'll heal you." I I like battle. <laughs> like, yeah, or like yeah. after seeing what Doctor Lou guy did, he's just like, "Oh, oh my god, oh I that yeah, I didn't yeah. want this at all. I'm I'm sorry." Oh god. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like <laughs> of, of the four fiends, he had the most personality, but he also had the most screen time to allow that personality yeah. to come out. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, Scarmillion, whatever his name is, Scar had like Scar probably the, 
Yeah, he probably had the the second most screen time. But Rubicon, I really liked him. It didn't seem like he was too. I mean, he was still after the the wrong thing, but he didn't seem like too bad of a guy, honestly. Yeah, you, I don't know. I think like the best comparison you can make is to like Perfect Cell from Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Like, clearly evil, <laughs> but also like you know he he does have some semblance of like not a conscience, but. Uh, redeeming decor- qualities yeah he has some decorum yeah. okay yeah. yeah totally um so i liked him i liked um the twins as well i thought that like they were they were they were really developed honestly they were more developed than i thought they were going to be um <clears throat> I liked their sacrifice. I was. I liked yep. how they were kind of influenced by Cecil a bit, almost looking at him like an older brother. Um, I believe they say that in the in the text as well. Is like before before they die, they're like you know we look at you like an older brother or something. Um, and they and all they know of you is they saw your redemption. Even if Cecil didn't see it at the time, they they see it in you. They were. They were there to spy on you to see if you were right for your redemption anyway. Um, and they see you taking action against all of this evil. And it kind of it kind of feels like they they were so in sync, too, when they made the sacrifice. Actually, pretty much with everything, which goes into the, the gameplay to the story as right. well, with one being a black mage, one being a white mage. I think their color schemes are like similar, but maybe inverted. I think they're inverted. Something. You have twin cast as well. Like they're they're very even if they're person like they they're just yin and yang. They they fit each other um, like that. Yeah. And <clears throat> I don't know. I I really liked them. My favorite characters probably Cecil, uh, Rydia. Golbez. And I, I I mean. Yeah, maybe if I had the 3D version, I would like him a little bit more. I thought he was yeah. pretty redeemable. Uh, it's definitely worth watching that stuff on YouTube, at least. Because, like, mm-hmm. gameplay-wise, it's basically just walking around and just having stuff play out and just, like, reading dialogue. But, you know, that that little bit apparently was supposed to be in the original game, I think. Okay. I can't remember, but... No, it was added in the 3D remake because Tokita saw the opportunity because he yeah. because he came on to direct the 3D remake after producing the original, which hey, awesome. Uh, yeah, but yeah, like that. I don't feel it's entirely necessary to have the flashback for Galbez, but it <clears> does <throat> do a lot for his character. I think it adds. Yeah, I feel like it would have made me. Yeah. yeah, I think it would have made me appreciate him that much more. I also like Rosa, but I feel like Rosa, like, unless she was talking to Cecil it, about, like, what was going on with him, I feel like there wasn't too much going on with her. It kind of no. felt like she was always, like, perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah, Around for the ride. Um, so, yeah, so I wish that there was something, like, she had a little bit more of an arc that I could grip onto. I just like her as a person, especially how she acted towards Cecil and really helped yeah. him see who he is. You know, I, that was nice. I agree. I, I really love Rydia, <clears throat> Cecil, and Kane. Kane is a very interesting mm-hmm. character. Uh, and, you know, I, like I said, a lot of people kind of reduce him down to, oh, he's just the token evil teammate. He's not evil. He's no, he's not evil he at does, all. He doesn't he's have controlled. any ill intent. Yeah, he doesn't. Yeah, he's just being manipulated. Like his mind is not his own. Like his intentions are pure. Like even you know, like yeah, like he harbored affections for Rosa, but like mind control is, it could happen to anyone. Yeah, like, mind control. It's just feelings. Exactly. Mind control aside, you know, he never was like, "I will take her for myself." He's just like. You know, I love her, but I also love Cecil as a brother. You know, this it is what it is. Uh, yeah. And the GBA and PSP versions play a bit more on that in uh in the final bonus dungeon in little uh Kane scenario that you can go into in there, where there's like a murder mystery where Kane is being oh. basically set up and he has to uh, it, it ultimately leads to like 
all right, you know, I, it's me, Dark Bahamut, acting as like a reflection of Kane's inner darkness. Kane, uh, will you embrace me and kill Cecil and take your prize? You'll get Rosa. It, it's not actually Cecil that he would slay, but it's just like a, it, yeah. it's in his subconscious. <clears throat> But like, it, and you, it's not a matter, it's not a moment where the story is written, where Kane will do a thing. It's a situation where the player chooses whether to embrace that darkness or fight against it. And once you do that, like, that's it. You can't see the other option. Uh, so it's it's really interesting. And then when you make your choice when you see the resolution to that you exit the chamber where it all takes place where for Kane it took place over the course of a week but for Cecil and everyone else outside the chamber it was only like a minute at most and it's like oh okay. and like Kane is like visibly shaken by what happens and Cecil's like hey are, are you okay like you've only been there for like a few minutes like what happened and like Kane just <laughs> yeah. Kane just doesn't want to talk about it Oh, okay. Like, yeah, it, Kane I like too, especially in, in retrospect, like thinking about it. Yeah. I think while I was playing it, I was like, I get what they're going for, but I'm not entirely sold on the character, especially <clears throat> with the whole mind control stuff that was going on with him. But in retrospect, his character arc is a cool one, and I wonder... I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter how it concludes in the after years, if it does, but... I, I know um, that he is in the after years. I know that Cecil's son, Theodore, does meet him. And also he meets Golbez. Um, although I'm not... I don't know under... I don't know the context, though. But mm. From what I understand, like... The whole thing with the after years is that, like, it's apparently just, like, a huge retread of the same narrative beats as the original Final Fantasy IV. That's the biggest criticism oh. I see of it, which... That's the most disappointing thing a sequel can be. Yeah. Theodore is what the son is. Yeah. Like, Theodore, but with a C. <laughs> yeah, like, like Cecil Theodore. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so, okay. like, named partially in honor of his brother. Mm-hmm. Overall, I really liked the story, even if I felt like there were a few times where, ne like, tonally, I think it fumbled. Um... But it definitely had me more hooked than any of the other Final Fantasy stories so far, especially with its uh, character storytelling. Exactly. Like, not every character is super deep and complex, but there's just enough of it in uh, Cecil, in Kane, in Golbez that you're, you're hooked just with the drama between them. Mm hmm. I wish I was more emotionally invested and not just furious at the game because I feel like that <laughs> ruined my personal experience. I was just so mad mm -hmm. at the game that part of me, it, it was like in one ear and out the other. I, uh, like some of the story parts are just completely gone from my memory. Like it's, it really, uh, it did detract for me just because of the frustration that I had to deal with. <coughs> Yeah, there's something to be said about, like, <clears throat> if you're having that difficult of a time, especially with certain boss fights or before or after big plot points happen, um, the pacing is completely thrown off for you. True. Yeah. As well. Which is, and that, that does matter in storytelling. With, with, so. with your experience with FF4, Fred, I am insatiably curious how you would take to Final Fantasy V. Because... We'll see. <laughs> Because Final Fantasy IV, where, uh, where is that game, the random encounters and the bosses are constructed with uh, the developers knowing exactly what tools you have. Final Fantasy V has a job system. It's, it's an expanded version of threes where you can kind of mix and match abilities and such. So you have a lot more tools and as such... Uh, they leave things a lot more open-ended, and it's been oh. described as it's been described as one of the more difficult games in the series. Truthfully, yeah. it's not it's not that hard. It's just that it leaves a lot of room open for you to experiment and figure out your own play style. Like 
to give you an idea of how open-ended it is, but how, like, uh, workable it is, uh, there is a charity event every year called the Four Job Fiesta, mm -hmm. where you are assigned four random jobs, and you can only mm. use those four jobs throughout the whole game. And no matter what jobs you get, you can beat the game. People have beaten the game with the most obtuse, seemingly useless jobs. Like it is, Do people it is try to beat it with the worst setup possible? Is that is like that what you mean? Uh, not not but not exactly, but like not not useless, but unorthodox. Okay. Yeah, like hmm. there there is no invalid job combination in Final Fantasy V. Really? Yeah. Okay. Not to mention, you now understand the mechanics of uh, ATB, what all items do, what back row, front row does, the flow of the battle. Uh, you understand the language of the game now. So you're also going into it with that because you yeah. got a lot better at the battle system and everything as you went in Final Fantasy IV. I would say right around where you fight the four fiends is where I started to really yeah. understand the ATB and a lot of the other battle mechanics. I would say right around there, yeah. I started to get the hang of it. There was also that boss that I was, I remember I was like talking you through as well to try to like be like, no, forget about this character, go yeah. with this character. You don't always have to use them and stuff like that. <clears throat> I feel like sometimes guiding through fights can help you understand your options in the battle system. Yeah, you definitely helped out with that a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, mm. all of them, if I was struggling super badly, you would give, you wouldn't tell me exactly what to do, but a lot of the <laughs> times you'd hint towards a solution that I could try. Cause yeah, I mean, true. words, when you're saying words on a stream, it, you, it, you can only get the context so much. Like I do have to kind of figure it out on my own, but you give me yeah. like the clues that definitely help me in those kind of situations mm -hmm. so now going into like well i know final fantasy 7 is next that one final fantasy 7 is it's an easy game it's an easy game yeah final it's, fantasy 7. especially if you play the modern versions where you can just like fast forward and stuff yeah. like that and turn off encounters yep um but going into Final Fantasy V, after playing Final Fantasy IV and Final Fantasy VII under your belt, you're going to, you're gonna, you're gonna have a good time, I think. Okay. I, I personally do believe so. Is there a pixel because remaster? You'll, you'll have all those mechanics. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The pixel remasters are available for one through six. Those are the games okay. that got pixel mm -hmm. remasters. Nice. And the pixel remaster of five is like it's it's pretty solid. Okay. Cool. Mm-hmm. I'm super excited to play it because I loved the job system of three. Yeah, you are, so. you are you are going to love five's job system. If you loved mixing yeah. and matching in three, but hated how it would like funnel you into like certain jobs at certain points, you are going to mm -hmm. love five's freedom. Especially because like in three, you don't get all the jobs until near the very end. In five, you yeah. have all of them like only like a third of the way through. You have all of them. Hmm. Oh, perfect. That's that's cool then. That's exciting. Okay. Um Awesome. So the only other thing I had to touch on in the story before just going on to some of the the bonus topics in closing was like the theme of darkness versus light. Um and I felt like this was touched on a little bit, not only with um Cecil's like changing of, of the job, but also at the end when they kind of talk about <clears throat> you know, Zemus was like, there's always going to be evil or my will will always live on or whatever right and i think it's fusoya who says there's always going to be evil within men's hearts and you kind of have to like live with that right yeah um which is very true uh here in real life right every single one of us has like a darkness inside of us or our shadow yeah right that <clears throat> we try to suppress we repress those thoughts but if we do not like accept and take hold of them and take control of them or tackle those those darker thoughts then they will control us in the same way that 
Zemes did um, the the people that he controlled during his lifetime, right? I think that's super important, right? To take home. Yeah, I think that you know, light and darkness. That's that's one way of uh, looking at it. But Takashi Takeda, when he was producing the original game, the original version of the game. There was a th- there was a guiding theme that he had in mind for it, and that was on, along a similar l- a wavelength, but much more nuanced. And that is strength alone isn't power, and that is very visible in Cecil, in Galbez, in Cain, Zemus, everyone. Like yep, Cecil was true. Cecil was strong at the beginning as a Dark Knight. But what po- like what power did he really have? What power to stand up to Baron or Golbez did he have? He didn't. Mm-hmm. And then he becomes a paladin. You sheath your sword, showing, you know, you know, you you eschew your strength and show your power for your you show your power through compassion, through understanding. Mm-hmm. And through that, you know, as a paladin right at the beginning, you know, Cecil levels up pretty fast at first, you know, yeah. mechanically, so you can catch up. But it's also showing that, you know, his his power comes from his desire to protect others and his compassion. Mm -hmm. And that continues through the game. And that's shaken a bit when he learns about his parentage and Golbez being his brother. But, you know, he ultimately has the resolve to accept that. You know, yes, Golbez is a dark reflection of me. I could have been in his position. And I'm not a totally good person. I have done bad things and I'm still yeah. capable of bad things. But, you know, I, I can overcome that. And if he can overcome his darkness controlling him, then I can keep going down this path of light. Yeah, Totally. Do you have anything to add on on that theme, Fred? I mean, I kind of interpreted it a little bit differently because I didn't know exactly how you wanted to talk about it. I interpreted it more oh, that's, that's as fine. I'm um, interested to hear more as how the darkness, ki- uh, the darkness in people's hearts, kind of turned into light. Like uh, people saw the light at the end of the tunnel and then followed it. And I feel like Cecil. And then, uh, then Kane for a little bit, and then you kind of get backstabbed by Kane. But that's not, I mean, <laughs> not from a lack of trying. Um, and then Golbez, <laughs> right? Golbez, re- re- like redeeming himself at the end, like he saw the light at the end of the tunnel. He wanted to, you know, atone for his sins. He wanted to make, you know, make everything right again. And I thought that's kind of how you had interpreted it in the like the dark versus light. Um, so I, I, I mean, I feel like they're all kind of they all kind of go into each other, mm-hmm. right? Even if you see it as the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I think we're all kind of saying similar things. Yeah, right? yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, cool. All right, so let's talk about our favorite music <laughs> i think we already touched on it a little bit with the theme of love for me um another standout track is the one that starts it i don't know if it's the theme of baron or the red baron theme oh, the red wings theme i couldn't theme. remember the red wings theme. what the name of that was such a strong song honestly i love that yeah. it sets it sets a mood and I love every time I hear it. <clears throat> I tried um, to find the track names, but a lot of the names I just couldn't find. So I don't know if the if the names that I have written down correlate with the correct track. I think they might, but I'm not entirely okay. sure. Uh, I have Welcome to Our Town. I don't know if that's the name of a track. It's the one that you, when you go into town. Yeah, that is, okay. yeah. That, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, I also like the track that they had made for Fable. I thought that was really strong. And I really liked... Oh, um, oh Fabul? Yeah, Fabul. Sorry, Fable. Oh, okay. Fable. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's a very strong track. Open mm-hmm. strong. It, it's very much reflective of uh, of the Chinese aesthetic that it's going for. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> I thought that was a very strong track. I thought it um it was very impactful. I thought the battle tracks were also very good. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. A lot of stress. Yeah, every added. time they come up, every single time, every single Final Fantasy game I play, the battle themes are oh, they always hit. Yeah. Every time it comes on, I'm like singing the melody to it. I remember even you hating your experience fighting the bosses. You're still like humming it. Like you start saying, yeah, still humming the battle theme. The boss track in Final Fantasy IV is so great. Yeah. I liked even the even like the random encounter music was still catchy yeah, yeah totally yeah, yeah. uematsu the thing is with the first six or so final fantasies they always start with that same baseline and yet mm-hmm. yeah it, and yet it always they all take on a life of their own and it's mm-hmm. they're all they're all great they're all great in their own ways i especially like i like uh i lost it <laughs> it's okay. all good all good yeah um <clears throat> i do agree though it's just it's always nice to i like i can listen to any final fantasy song and i know who composed it almost like especially with uh uematsu um not only in the battle themes but also in the town and character themes just the way that he structures melodies i can just i'm like oh this sounds a lot like tifa's theme or like like you can hear a lot of um a lot of the melodic structure that's almost reused it's it's like a lot of his style yeah. that never feels old every each song still feels like it has its own identity despite those melodic similarities yeah. a, a uh, huge, and i think a, that's important a major example of that is <clears throat> Aerith's theme it, it's so similar to celeste's theme from final fantasy 6 but mm. but more like you know it's almost along the same melodic track, but just with a few notes removed uh, to give it its mm-hmm. own identity so that it's instead of instead of melancholic, it becomes serene. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you, you already know Aerith's theme, but uh, you, have you yeah. played Final Fantasy VI, Juice? I have not played six yet. I may have heard the theme in passing because I've heard a lot of music from Final Fantasy VI, um, but I can't think of it off the top of my head because it doesn't have that emotional connection yet. You are in for a treat. Yeah, I'm really excited <laughs> I, to get there my, for sure. My video on it is five hours long, so I saw. I'm like, I, I can't watch I this saw until that. after I play the game. <laughs> Oh, did you? Because I, uh, I, I was just like <laughs> looking through retrospectives. I saw one that was mm-hmm. like five hours long. I wonder if it was yours. It might have been. It just went up. <laughs> Probably uh, was. It just went up this week. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was today. So maybe it was five hours. Yeah. That's wild. A lot to say. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. To, yeah. A lot. A lot to say. Yeah. I'm excited to get around to that one. Um, other than the theme of love and the battle themes and, and some of the town themes that I I, I can't think of many theme. off the top of my head, the dungeon theme. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just like there's this there's this mysticism to it, but also there's just mm-hmm. this this danger underpinning it. It's like yeah, this is something wondrous, but also like watch your step because you know the darkness in here it goes on forever. You don't want to mm-hmm. get lost in it. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm literally just like I have the soundtrack open and another on one of my monitors right oh, now, nice. just kind of like clicking through just to check. Um, the 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 Ridius theme. How could I forget Ridius theme too? Theme, Ridius oh my theme goodness! Oh my yes. gosh! How did I yeah, forget that, that one such too? A good one and having it play again, like when she comes back and stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I believe it plays when she comes back, yeah. as opposed to like when you first meet her and you're first making that connection with her. That was like, oh, nice. Yeah. I'm glad they brought back that motif. Yeah, it's v- uh-huh. it's very small. It's very it's a very intimate theme. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. For uh, for the first, I I think it's reasonable to say that Riddy is the first ally, the first permanent ally that Cecil gained in his fight against Baron because. Yeah, Rosa probably would have said yes, absolutely, like without skipping a beat. And Kane said, yeah. "Yes, I will help you." But you know, then they were separated, and Kane was mind controlled. Rydia 
was there. Like, and Cecil had to, like, work to gain her trust. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... I, I like that. And then once that trust was gained, like, her trust in him never wavered. Mm. Totally. Um, Fred, I'm surprised you didn't bring up Edge when we were talking about favorite characters. I was thinking about it afterwards, and I thought... I, I, I was thinking about bringing it up at the end, um... Because I yeah. did, I did really like Edge. I think the fact that he didn't have to do anything. He was a prince. I mean, he was royalty from the beginning. He didn't really have to do anything, but he chose to. He was so sick. Yeah, well, th and then also he had a stronger resolve. Yeah. When he saw what his parent, you know, what happened to his parents and stuff. He just kind of had that attitude that he really wanted to. He didn't want to, he didn't want to have the prince's responsibilities. Yeah. He didn't want that role that he was born into. He was like, no, I'm not like this. I'm against the I grain. I want to go out there. Yeah, and I want to, I'm all action. And even in the epilogue, he's <clears throat> not, like not really all that enthused with having to rebuild uh, his kingdom. Yeah. Mm hmm. He just wants oh, to. He just wants to simp for Rydia. Yeah, I don't blame Same him. Same though, honestly. <laughs> I completely forgot that Cecil is voiced by Sasuke from Naruto. I forgot to bring that up. How did I not bring that up? <laughs> you, oh you, yeah, you can hear it. You see, you can hear it you, very you see, clear when you hear Yuri Lowenthal. You say <sighs> Sasuke. When I yeah. hear Yuri Lowenthal, I think Yosuke. <laughs> <laughs> Because I love Nar Yosuke, Naruto. Naruto's one of my Yosuke favorite. From? Persona 4. Oh, oh, yeah. I haven't gotten around to Persona yet. I'm going to play Persona 1 eventually. I'm going to start there. It's eventually. Be interesting. Another, <clears throat> yeah, eventually. Another great track <laughs> is the, uh, the backing track for the Giant of Babel and the Final Dungeon. Like, mm. Ooh, like I brought this yeah. up to a musician friend of mine, and he he disagreed which is understandable but it feels like at least with like the instruments used that the final dungeons theme is sort of a not a reprise but a sort of a riff on the red wings theme which was cecil's theme um um oh, i can't I cannot remember. even remember hold on because yeah. I, I want to see if there are any repeating motifs. I can't like by the final dungeon theme. You mean like the final floors of the lunar subterrain where it becomes that like yeah the crystal yeah, floor the, type of the track is called within <clears throat> the giant. Within the giant, I remember it being like tech heavy. Within the giant, let's see. It starts Listen like to that. It. Yeah, with that bass line. It's the brass section that really gets me thinking of that. Mm-hmm. Like, as it, yeah. as it builds up. Yeah. And then... What was... Red Wing theme. The red, red Wing theme. <clears throat> I mean like it's 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 not the same melody. It's not the same yeah. composition. But just the use of the horns, just the brass section like really recalls that for me. Yeah, it's it's definitely similar. I, I can see vein. why it would remind you of that. I would I would have to listen to it more closely uh before like making a like a, a decision on whether I think it was calling for that, but if it, regardless, if it makes you feel that, especially in those last moments, I feel like that's that's more important. Yeah. Uh, if you, I would have liked to make that connection. Honestly, I would have loved to. Yeah, I'm not because I because yeah, I'm not a musician <laughs> like you, but I do mm -hmm. try to listen to music. Like I love I love light motif. Like I yeah. like. I love Halo, for example, and like listening to Marty O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore's work on uh, on the Halo series, and even like uh, Neil da Neil Davidge and Cos uh, Cosma Genocchi and everyone who worked on Halo Infinite. There's a lot of recurring motifs and great use of light motif, especially 
throughout the series, particularly in that original trilogy, between uh, 1 and 3, especially. So, mm. you know, like, I, I recommend, like, watching interviews with Marty O'Donnell, because he really dives into his... Uh, his sort of eth uh, ethos on that and what uh, how he uh, how, what he refers to as emotional equity. OK, yeah, I'll definitely look into that. The only thing I know currently about the Halo soundtrack because I haven't played them is that Misha Mansoor from Periphery, which is one of my favorite bands, worked on one of one of the recent Halo tracks, I believe. Probably. That's literally all I know. Did he really? <clears throat> That's yeah, sick. He it was almost oh, certainly man, love Infinite, because like, Infinite had like three or four composers, and I know it was Neil Davidge and Cosmo Genocci, who previously had worked on Metal Gear uh, on four, and then five was just uh, Cosmo Genocci. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It must. It, I think he, it must have been just like guests and stuff. Huh. Um, he, actually, they also had a song called Thanks No Buo as their final song on their most recent album, oh, so uh -huh. they're all nerds. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but okay. Um, is the game worth playing today? Should I start Honest? this? Would you? You like can start it? it. You can start it. Okay. I I think it de I think it depends on what you want in a game in an RPG. If you want a good story, if you want something that can emotionally engage, you want, uh, but also something that isn't complicated then yes, I think that it is worth playing today. As for which version, that uh, that also kind of depends, because, like, most of them are, are, are interchangeable. If you want a challenge, then the 3D version. If you want... Uh, if you want something that's uh, very accessible, very easygoing, you're here more for the story than the gameplay, do the pixel remaster. Um, for me, I would say it's worth playing, but of course, it, it depends on what your, um, <clears throat> leniency is, or what, you know, what your tolerance is for older JRPGs, because there are a lot of gamers today who have never played games like this, you know? Uh -huh. And if, if they want to get interested in Final Fantasy for may not be the one I recommend to them to start, you know, I, right. I don't know if I would recommend one through four right yeah, um hey I, I as far as like if you're looking to get into final fantasy i wouldn't say four is the worst place to start but mm. it is not the one that i would recommend first i would i would yeah, sooner recommend and, like seven or ten or six. Ten, yeah <clears throat> yeah something like that um but for someone like me, I guess, who wants to experience all sorts of games from all sorts of different genres, and, I mean, I love JRPGs, so, you know, my favorite genre of, of game, I would say totally, but unless you, unless you have, like, experience in the genre, I would definitely recommend playing the Pixel Remaster first. I think it's just good for modern gamers, because at their leisure they get to experience these things on their own terms mm -hmm. um, with the, all of the quality of life updates that, that they have along with the game just being faster and snappier than the other versions being able to run around faster having more space on the map um, for you to see all the hidden paths Explor exploration seems to be more incentivized um experiencing the ATB battle system for the first time and wanting to see how it developed from there. Like, there are so many reasons to play the game along with what you you added with the story and, and the characters um, that I would say absolutely. I can't see I can't see a reason why not to play Final Fantasy 4. But, it, I mean, I guess if you're just not into JRPGs... That's a fair point. Whatever. Yeah, if you're, yeah, if you're not into <clears throat> JRPGs... And you aren't really looking to get into them, then maybe look elsewhere. Maybe Chrono Trigger might be more your speed. Uh, but like, if you if you already have familiarity with JRPGs, but you haven't played Final Fantasy IV, it is worth the play. It may not blow your mind. It may not move you to tears or anything. 
but it, it's still something that's worth playing for more than just historical significance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I, I would agree with that. How about you, Fred? Okay, so I do have a extremely different view of this game because it's the only traditional JRPG I've played. I didn't play the 2D uh, remaster, so uh, the quality of life things that that added, I'm sure would have been nice for me as a beginner, but I hate to say this, but I personally don't think this is the game for anybody's first JRPG, especially the 3D. I um, <laughs> I would fair. probably suggest if you guys said seven was like a easier, you know, beginner oriented game, I would say that might be the place to get started with this. But uh, and it was for millions. Yeah, it would have really. seven was the breakout. <coughs> if mm-hmm. if it was up to me, I wouldn't touch another one. Uh, that's just how it made me feel. <laughs> But uh, the, the oh, fact yeah. that we're playing them for podcasts adds that sense of me wanting to, you know, explore these worlds. Um, so that, that is a good, you know, motivator for me to continue with these. But I, I can't say it was the best experience for me because of just, I mean, I thought it was difficult. I thought it was really hard. And I know... I know I don't have the most tolerance for difficulty. I get frustrated pretty easily against bosses, but I'm sure I'm not the worst one out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. And one thing I will say is if this is going to be your first JRPG, probably and something I should have sent to you was that at least the original Final Fantasy IV player's guide yeah. that explains all of the mechanics to you so that you're not so lost in battle, which you know really tripped up Fred on his first traditional JRPG playthrough with how complex a lot of this, this stuff can be. You know, there's so many different status ailments, what spells cure what, mm-hmm. uh, different levels of spells, when to use this, how come there are items that use the same things as the spells and keeping track of It's just a lot of stuff that uh, I feel like you would want a little guide for it, right? Do you remember when <laughs> so. I was, uh, remember Endgame when you were like, why are you using Kira and not Kiraga? I didn't even think <laughs> yes. of doing that. I thought I was just wasting MP. I was like, oh, I'm not going to yeah. use this because I or, only have a finite you amount. Single target. You yeah. Never like yeah, yeah. single target heal. You didn't know that it like cut the uh, the power of the magic spell. I had no by... clue. <laughs> yeah. And it's stuff like that that like, if you don't know that stuff, how are you going to like get through a lot of these harder battles? And to yeah. think you know? the, some of these people are not going to be streaming it and people are not going to be giving them hints. So you got to think about it also in that way they have no if there is no um no guidance and this is your first experience it's going to be an extremely frustrating experience yeah yeah i mean now you have like the basic flow of it down you've got the terminology and Mm -hmm. general uh the general idea of how these games work in your head Every Final Fantasy is different. Uh, so, like, yeah. Final Fantasy IV is, like, easily the most vanilla game in the series. Really? So, like, yeah, where it's, like, uh, your characters learn spells by leveling up, and mm-hmm. all of their abilities are intrinsic. When you move on to seven, nobody has intrinsic abilities. You give, it, you give them their abilities through the stuff that you equip to them. So, okay. like... Yeah, by default everyone the materia. Yeah, by default <coughs> oh, everyone yeah, yeah. has by default everyone has attack and items whether th- what magic they can use that depends on whether you equip it with them uh and stuff like that. So you you kit people out and you experiment over time with materia in 7 whereas like in 5 you learn magic by buying it in the shop you just buy the spell once and everyone can use it assuming they're using a job oh, that casts really? magic yeah like uh final fantasies one two and three did that uh did that mm-hmm. yeah 
Yeah, so like that's just one example. And then six, you learn magic by equipping Magicite and gaining AP, and then you'll learn spells. They all do it. They all do things differently, so that way, you know, it's all it's all similar, but it's also all bespoke. You're not going to have the same experience every time. So like, you yeah, don't like yeah. Final Fantasy four, you may like five, you may love six, you may find seven okay. Yeah. And now that you understand the basics of it, I think you're going to have a, a better time going into any other Final Fantasy. I, I except agree. for two. <laughs> I mean, you guys two. already did the podcast for two, so I got a cheat code. I don't really yeah, have to don't, play you don't, if I don't, you don't want you don't to. Have or, to play two. or, Fred, you could just watch my videos on Final Fantasies 1 through 3. That's true. That's I probably true. should. <clears throat> yeah, well, those, well, are, those one, are good. Well, 1 through 4 now that you've got 4 under your belt. You can yeah. see mm -hmm. more it would add a little the original aspect. 4. Yeah. Now I get to watch that video too. I didn't want to spoil myself on your opinions before the podcast because I wanted to go in blind with all uh, of us. Right. Yeah, <laughs> get, get, get ready for two hours and twenty minutes of yes. That. Mm hmm. All <laughs> right. That being said, um, I guess do we have uh, closing statements? Who wants to start with closing statements on Final Fantasy IV? Shill yourself, and then we'll say our goodbye. This game um, is something else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, a closing statement for me. I'm Fred. I'm Friedrich. Um, I play games on Lux and Tux Live. That's my YouTube channel. Um, yeah, I got through the Zelda series for the most part, and now I played Final Fantasy IV after those experiences. So uh, it's a big change of pace. Um, I'm excited for Seven. I, I think that'll be a really good podcast. Will you be I streaming can't seven? I will be. I will be. Ooh, I'm gonna stream when? seven. Uh, after Zelda it's one. Be after Zelda one. Yeah. Yeah. Zelda one, and then seven, and then seven, and then seven <clears throat> remake slash integrate probably, <laughs> and then I'm gonna then go seven into rebirth. <laughs> seven rebirth. So there's gonna be a lot of Final Fantasy yeah. seven. <laughs> right. I, I. I mean, I. I'm just gonna say it without spoiling anything. I mean, you've already played remake. Yeah. Uh, Playing the original seven first really enhances the remake. That's why I told him he yeah. has to play it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it'll add Best another perspective before I play seven again. I'm going to play seven on a fresh account. I'm not going to OP it with my max oh, remake. Yeah, yeah. remake. It will definitely give you a whole new perspective yeah. on the stuff that's going on. Yeah, 100%. Uh, how about you, Andrew? Closing statements? Uh, my closing statement, <clears throat> Final Fantasy IV is still a solid game, uh, but it's also one that I had played to death for a video, a video that you can see on my YouTube channel. It's literally just my name, Andrew Bluett. It's blue with two T's on the end. Uh, I'm doing all the Final Fantasies, including 10-2, 13-2, Lightning Returns, uh, and Final Fantasy Tactics, and uh, more pertinently, I'm doing Chrono Trigger very soon. Ooh. Uh, these retrospectives are disgustingly long and horrifically <laughs> in-depth without being beat-for-beat beat plot recaps. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, fi the Final Fantasy VI video is a whopping five hours long, uh, just mm -hmm. to give you an idea. So definitely go check that out again. The channel is just my name, Andrew Bluett. That's blue with two T's on the end. Awesome. All right. Awesome. And for me, I would say that Final Fantasy IV is a pretty good game that I think if you're into JRPGs uh, or Final Fantasy, definitely worth going to play. Um, I enjoyed my time, like 90% of the time playing it. I was addicted to the gameplay loop of the classic JRPG and the snappiness of the pixel remaster and the incentivization to explore. Uh, and I hope that people also have a good time playing it and uh, through that get to enjoy the characters the same way that I did. Um, and as for what I'm doing over on my main channel, the Juice Box, um, y'all have character analysis on characters from Doki Doki Literature Club. Um, they're about 20 minutes long. I also have a few on Sonic the Hedgehog, and we are going to have 
character analyses on Cloud and Zack coming out early next year uh, to nice. coincide with the releases of Rebirth. So if you are interested in character analysis, you're going to like that. And while you're here, might as well subscribe if you enjoyed the content today, as we have podcasts on Final Fantasy 1 through 3. Um, and we will continue to have podcasts on the remaining Final Fantasies throughout time. I can't promise when all of them will be out because we cover a bunch of different series, but uh, there's enough hours of content here to entertain you, I think. Fair um, point. <laughs> that being said, thank you guys so much for coming on. Definitely go check out uh, Andrew's channel or else. Or else. And uh, <laughs> Or else. And thank you so much for watching up till this point. Really appreciate it. And hey, you look nice today. Until next time, catch you later. Thank you for watching.